Well, what is going on? Where's my Where's my team? Where's my fam? Where are we? Oh, okay. Yo. There we, hey. there we are. What's going What's on? How are we? What's up, big dog? Um, big is, dog. <laughs> you guys are going to laugh at me right now. Uh, Probably. I'm doing something different real quick, okay? Because I know we pre-record. That's our thing. Um, but I'm putting – so we're live, but we're private. Like this, so this is private, but I want to make sure we're private. So I'm going to give this like a cup while we're talking, you know, and just doing the introduction. I'm keeping a close eye, making sure there's nobody who could hop on this because we are a private reserve podcast and we like to do our private podcast and then we unprivate it. So I think we're good though. I think we're good. What the hell does that mean? So like we, we, we record our podcasts, right? So it's live, meaning it's live, but it's a private live, meaning People need to have so the, we can like accept them in or something. Exactly. Right. Right. So like, let's just say at some point we want to, you know, people are trying to pay, you know what I'm saying? They want to be like, Hey, you know, what up with the, I want to be with <laughs> private. We could let, you know, specific people. In. I kind of like, 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 like the $2 tier, like they get out of the live, like, 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 like the $50, they get the group chat. Listen, if we have a guest that's kind of like, which none of our guests are, but that, you know, it, I think an open bracket, you could come on in. Like a guest like we have today, 50 bucks a month minimum. Like I'm talking about the high yeah. bracket. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get paid. Exactly. You need to be up. Like if you want the insides and be able to have, wow, I didn't even really, this is, this is all happening now. It's like, it's life organic. Up. what'd you say? It's organic. It's oh god. <laughs> organic. Anyways, yeah, guys, I've been gone for two weeks. Yeah, man. We we be, yeah, we, we took uh, a week break. And now yeah, we're back. Ready to rock. Feels good. How are you guys doing? I miss you guys a lot. Busy as fuck. Yep. You guys are killing it. Uh shout out to the sponsor, Cold Blooded Cafe, www.coldbloodedcafe.com. Freshest and the bestest. Delivered to your doorstep. You can't get better than that, man. And they have anything from the little oh, tiny pinkies all the way to the gigantic mammoth. Right? Mammoth. Mammoth, super mammoth. Um, and then obviously shout out to a sim containers, man. We already know what the deal is with any kind of reptile egg that touches you know, soil or ground, whatever, substrate. You got to make sure you put those eggs inside a <laughs> sim container, man. It's all about sim containers, straight up. Uh, but guys, um, tonight's guest, whoa, man. I mean, I am pretty stoked about tonight's guest. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, Stephen, you went ahead and scouted this gentleman. And then, because, you know, you're like, hey, man, we definitely need somebody like a, a colubrid person, like somebody who's, you know, like, you know, working with colubrids. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, you're right. You know, and colubrids, you know, there's, you know, small colubrids, not, you know, kind of medium colubrids. And then there's fucking big colubrids. This guy works with some, with some big colubrids. He's stoked. I mean, he's he's one of the, I don't know he's stoked. I'm sorry. He's one of the sickest dudes I've seen out working with the project that he's working in. Uh, mm -hmm. Wait a minute. That's not him. <laughs> Warren. Oh, my God. He's so <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Just oh, my God, Warren. How did he, how did he get in here? Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> God damn, Warren. There we go. Oh, okay. God. Bro. Again, sick ass thumbnail uh, pick provided by our guest. Um, dude, just found out this gentleman is from Southern California, Los Angeles, LA in the house. And here Ooh. he is. John from Black Pearl Reptiles. What is up, John? Hey. What's going on, guys? Yeah. Dude, welcome to the channel, man. Welcome to Happy the podcast. Friday. Happy Friday. Cheers Thank you. To, Appreciate you having me. Cheers to the guests. How you living, John? Uh, we're doing all right, man. We're doing all right. Just hanging in there. You working I'm from? Working. You working from home during all this, you know, ordeal? 
Uh, well, yes and no. By day, I'm a school teacher. So, um, you know, the uh, when everything went down in March, I was I was working from home and now I'm on summer vacation. So uh, now I'm working one, uh, from home with the reptiles. So cool. rep sounds like a dreamy, uh, dreamy situation. Uh, right, guys? I mean, they, they work from home technically for, with the reptiles. Uh, they happen to have a whole freaking side of rodents, too. <laughs> But uh, anyways, you know, it's, it's awesome. Now, how many reptiles do you keep? I mean, we, we were talking about you. You work with colubrids and whatnot. But give us like a little rundown of the, the species that you're, you're currently keeping and uh, yeah. what breeding and stuff like that, if you don't mind. Well, so we, we specialize in indigos and crevos, which are snakes from the Jarmarchon genus, uh, which is one of the larger colubrids out there. So that's really kind of the bulk of what we do. I have a uh, full-time 50% business partner with all of it. So at my house specifically, I've got, you know, half the collection, the rest are at my buddy's house and uh, you know, his house, my house, you know, we're, we're, we've got several pairs of each of the major six types of indigos and crebos that you see in the pet trade. So as far as quantity of snakes, I mean, people ask me, I don't know, man, <laughs> it, it depends on, uh, it depends on what type of year, what time of year you talk to me or, you know, right about now I'm in the middle of all the babies hatching. So, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, attack on a tack on another uh, couple hundred to the collection size. And then come November, December, I'll be all sold out and, you know, I'll be back down to the minimum. But um, we try to have a big diverse breeding group of each of the major types of indigos and crebos and all that. So uh, we also try to kind of, hedge things a little bit. So, you know, I've got half the Texas Indigos in my house. My partner's got half of his house. That way, if there's some kind of issue with incubation or breeding or conditions or whatever it is that we've got all of our projects backups. split. So there's backups, right? So yeah. um, anything that we're super excited about, like something a little different or unique or whatever, we try to make sure we, you know, keep it split and divided just to make sure, you know, uh, nothing goes sideways on us. Yeah. Uh, I mean, cause working with, I mean, colubrids, but there, I don't know if, if every colubrids like, you know, attitude or their behavior is the same, but they're, you know, mangroves are sometimes, you know, they're, they're unpredictable or, you know, I mean, Steven, you work with how many different type of colubrids yourself? Not, not many. Um, we just have, just four species here. There are five species here at the moment. Um, but yeah, oh. yeah. I was bad to fly. Okay. Anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, they're, and especially like the Jermire you know, like they're just fast kind of, you know, high energy, high strung snakes. It's a cool little, uh, for us, a little separation from like the pythons and boas primarily. That we have. So, Way separate. Yeah. We used to have a ton of corn snakes. Yeah, well, you know, the uh, pythons and boas, you know, there's a lot of variation in temperament on all those, too. And it's the yeah. same with indigos, you know. Some some colubrids are, uh, I don't know, I think indigos in general are just are a lot more inquisitive and interactive than a lot of even colubrids. So yeah. that's kind of one of the things that makes them interesting to work with from a temperament standpoint. Well, I was leading into something. I was going to ask you if like breeding indigos and crebos are as easy as corn snakes because oh, well snakes you know uh, no <laughs> <laughs> the, the short answer is no the answer short. um you know i mean it's it's you know a part of the thing when you when you uh look at you know how uh easily available um <clears throat> reptiles are in the trade some of that is uh how easy are they to breed you know and um one of the things that I've been able to enjoy is that, you know, my partner and I have sort of figured it out, you know, we can, we can uh, breed them and we do it pretty well. Uh, but not everyone can. So, you know, you, you, you end up, you know, not having a whole lot of other people offering uh, for sale, the same stuff that we do, which is uh, kind of one of the perks. But um, that being said, I mean, I, I've, I've not really approached any of that as like, I have my secrets and I'm not going to tell anyone so I can suppress my competition. Uh, you know, I, I want people to be successful with the animals that they buy. And if they want to breed them, they should know how to do it. And, and so, uh, it's part of why I do shows like this now and again is, you know, open book. And 
I want people to to learn and to know about uh, you know what they're getting into if they're going to purchase a uh, uh, drum arc on. So, so what, go on, Stephen. I was going to ask just what was your initial draw to the to the genus? Um, you know, I'm assuming that probably wasn't your start in reptiles. It, maybe it was, but like, what led up to interest in dry Marcon and then specializing in that genus? Well, I've always been a little bit more of a colubrid guy. I mean, I've had pythons and, you know, some boas and stuff in the past, but really, um, you know, it started off with kind of field stuff, you know. Uh, I'm also an avid field herper as well, so I get out and do all that stuff too. But, you know, when I was a little kid, I was out catching gopher snakes and kink snakes and whatever else. And so, that's kind of what I knew, you know, growing up and, um, you know, and I used to keep all that stuff, you know, for fun here and there as a kid, you know, I'd go out and collect some gopher snakes in the hills and I'd put them in a big cage and, uh, they'd breed and I'd get babies and I'd go release the babies back where I caught the parents and just kind of fun thing I was doing when I was a little kid. Uh, you know, and then somewhere, um, you know, uh, after that, I, came in contact with people that were breeding like in the pet trade, you know? And, uh, so I thought that was kind of cool. And so I, I thought it'd be neat to be able to like, you know, breed something that's not from Southern California and mm -hmm. maybe even sell it for a couple bucks, you know, to help pay for the rodents and whatever. So I yeah. started off breeding, um, Honduran milk snakes and doing like the morphs with all that sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, I would get the babies, I would sell them and it would pay for the rodents. And then I'd make a couple bucks extra. And then I'd spend that money on buying something else. And early on, I mean, one of the first snakes that I bought was a pair of blacktail Kribos. I mean, I saw them online. I thought they were super cool. And the whole idea of them being related to indigos, which at that point were out of my price range was, was cool. I mean, I, I mean, everyone's heard of Eastern indigos. Um, so, uh, you know, I bought those and, and bred those immediately and the learning curve was pretty steep from there, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. with my level of experience at the time. And so uh, for them, I was just, just fully hooked. I mean, you know, one, w once you own them, it either works for you, it doesn't. And you, and you, most people who own them just absolutely love them. And so from that initial pair of blacktail Kribos, next thing I had to have all of them. I had to have yellowtails, I had to have unicolors, I had to get the Easterns. Uh, I met up with my business partner and, uh, you know, he brought some of his animals into the mix and uh, getting the Mexicans and the Texans and then all the different color variations of each uh, species was cool to get into. And so next thing you know, I mean, I, you know, we have a big breeding group of all those types, you know, and that's, uh, yeah the demand has been there and then it sort of turned into, you know, a nice little, uh, nice little hobby. Now, what year was all this? Like, can you kind of give us a little breakdown on when, what, what year this kind of became uh, a hobby? Uh, you're you? looking, it developed somewhere between 15, 20 years ago. Okay, cool. Damn. All right. So well, well established in this, um, you know, I bet a lot of trial and errors too, right? You know, that's the other thing that I've really liked about having a, uh, partner with all this is that, you know, we, we bounce ideas off each other all the time, you know, and, uh, you know, and if there's something that I'm doing with my husbandry that works well, um, you know, we share ideas with each other. If there's something I'm struggling with, I'll hit him up and, and, you know, and we, we try to always approach it from a standpoint of, uh, there's always something to learn. It doesn't matter how many years you've done it or how many babies you've produced or whatever. We're still struggling to, to, you know, try to get better with our productivity, with, um, um, with the health of our animals and making sure that, uh, you know, we have our fertility rates are higher and yeah. producing more robust babies and all that kind of stuff. And it's just, you know, it's a constant desire to kind of keep improving. So there's still a lot to learn for sure. I think it's amazing that you have, <laughs> you have a partner who's on the same mission as you, because you guys are pretty sure you guys are both learning stuff as you're going along, but learning different stuff as you go along. You know what I mean? And you guys are, like you said, communicating to each other um, and just picking stuff up as you go. But, you know, you have two minds into it versus one. And then so two different experiences come together as one. I think it's pretty sick. Uh, yeah, it can just be little stuff sometimes too. Like I'll be at his house and I'll see him doing like just a little something with his substrate or humidity or whatever. And it'll give yeah. me an idea. Or And sometimes we end up, you know, even though we – didn't talk about it, we end up arriving with some of the same strategies, you know, you know, uh, that I'll start doing something and he's been doing it all along. And it just, cause it just sort of works out, you know? Hey, hey, Steven, who was, uh, 
who are people that you kind of picked up off of? Like, you know, like, cause I'm, I don't, I don't know. Or, or are you just your know, baby genius and fucking did everything out of a book? Like, what, is, what did you like? Cause you know, you have a lot of stuff that you've, that you've done obviously off of the, all the years you learned from and stuff. So <laughs> did, is there anybody out there that you picked from or like, you know, that, anything like that? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, Forrest was obviously a guy like that for me. We'd go back and forth with ideas even, you know, even before I started working here. Um, back when I was younger though, my old job, uh, my old uh, co-worker, Zach Bullish, is now the um, curator of uh, Thai Parks Iguana Land. We would talk for hours about, you know, just husbandry in general. He was more of a monitor guy, um, still is. And uh, David Newman, he's a conjurer guy from back in Chicago. We would kind of, he was like my first conjurer mentor. Um, we would go back and forth. He would, you know, he taught me a lot about conjurers. Kind of got to learn a lot about more advanced husbandry from him. Um, well, you know, a lot of people on I mean, MJ, we go back and forth talking about it too. And uh, Des also for a long time. So there's a lot of people, you know, uh, that's what's so great about social media in particular, or just the whole scene is that everyone's just always kind of trying to bounce ideas off each other and whatnot. And, uh, you know, we all have the same goal in mind. Uh, I feel like there really are fewer people than you think who are kind of concealing their information or aren't really willing to share and help each other out, you know. The more success that's happening across the board, you know, the more it benefits everybody in the end, really. That's sick. What about you, Des? I mean, you have <clears throat> quite a <clears throat> quite a bit of an establishment yourself being in the hobby, you know, you and Forrest working with uh Robbie, what, two thousand ten or something like you I mean you've you've yeah. seen a lot, you've seen a lot, right? Who is somebody that you really kind of uh, or what is what is some stuff that you've really picked up from from other people? I mean, Forrest initially, um I was always in school. He was always the one doing this. And then I kind of just started working with him more. And he did <clears> a lot. And then Cody, Cody Bartolini lived with us. I think I learned like the best handling skills and like feeding baby chondros and just patience in general. That was a big difference between Cody and Forrest is Cody had the patience um, to teach, yeah. and, like, do things the right way. <laughs> um, but no, um, and then, yes, um, and then being at Robbie's place, um, I really started getting hands-on, especially with crocodiles. Um, and then since we've been in Indiana, um, it's pretty much just been through social media and just watching people and, um, like, going to shows and talking to different people. And, um, like, Bill Brandt, we, we used to just spend hours talking to him whenever we were in Daytona. Oh, yeah. And the Barkers, whenever we're in Texas, I spent a lot of time talking to Tracy and, um, yeah, I'm just getting around on social media. So, um, social media, John, <clears throat> obviously, thank God for social media. We met, you know, it's the only way we're able to pull you on here. Um, <laughs> But social media is not something you're like, like we were talking earlier. You're not, you don't post stories of your face every day. You're not like, you, you, the whole marketing isn't too aggressive for you on social media. You know, you got your Instagram page, you post sick ass pictures, videos. Um, you do have a protocol for people who want to inquire snakes. Am I right? There's an application right. process or something like that. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about that real quick? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, uh, I've been, when I sort of started getting into the whole breeding thing and selling stuff, it was, you know, the whole social media element wasn't there yeah. yet. Um, you know, so it was doing the reptile shows and that sort of thing. And then it was a website. So I, one, one of the things that I did right, I think uh, a lot of things I did wrong for sure. But one of the things I did right early on was uh, a website that had a, a lot of information and a lot of cool pictures. And that was sort of my yeah. goal. And I've just sort of ridden that all along and given the very high demand for what I work with and channeling people through the website. Um, I don't really feel a whole lot of need or, or push to promote my stuff, um, you know, through social media, you know, I do a little bit to just maintain exposure and things like that. But, you know, listen, this is not my, this is not my primary source of income. This is not my job. It's something I do on the side. And, um, you know, I'm, I've been fortunate enough to, over the years, to have been able to build that sort of customer base and, and demand for what I sell to the point where I don't, I, I don't really advertise and I don't feel a need to, you know, be doing uh, everything that a lot of people do on social media. So um, I'm sure it'd be a little different if I had a hard time selling all my stuff. But, um, 
that makes uh, sense. <laughs> you know, but it's 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 harder to be motivated. I mean, listen, there's uh, there are a lot of things that can be done from a business perspective, and I love all that stuff. You know, to, you know the the business element of it and the marketing element of it. I mean, all that's all that's super fun. I really enjoy doing that sort of thing. But um, right. you know, I definitely want to have a presence social media wise, but I'm uh, uh, I've not been one to to be all over it like you like you said. Well, it's a place to be, honestly. You know, yeah. where like, you don't even yeah. need the promotion or the selling. Yeah, luckily, rodents sell themselves. So, yeah, yeah um, right. We don't do a whole lot, honestly. But you guys, you guys technically don't need social media. Like, if you guys, if you guys, for, um, excuse, if you guys, Stephen and Desiree, if you guys wanted to just say, you know, let's let's forget Instagram and let's cut it off. Your your business will still be oh, yeah. sustainable, right? Oh yeah wild with this but it but then we literally what, haven't put anything into marketing like occasionally we'll boost a post somewhere and you'll get some hits on it but mm -hmm. like force never wanted to either he's just he was underground about his reptile collection too and that's what he always say the rodents will sell themselves like we go to the shows and i think we get a lot of um new customers that way too but yeah, totally i just don't have time like i need to hire someone that just that's just all they do so if just, anyone wants to be a social media manager <laughs> the type person you know I mean, there's a, like there's literally two yeah. different companies but, but, some office work yeah. but, I'm, I'm sure the interview process is no joke on that there's probably thorough thorough interview pro for you to get hired for that position imagine for them to I be mean, in, in charge of your page steven in charge of your page oh, no not in charge of like my page you know like oh, posting up ads or, like the facebook or the cobota cafe page yeah just yeah, I well, think customer service in general because yeah. I spend about one or two days a week dealing with customer service. It's at the end of the week, so I think some people get irritated with me. But I I have a, a shit ton of reptiles to clean and like a full staff of people to manage and make sure you know things are going smooth. So yeah. no, uh, does I hear I hear where you're coming from. You know, for me. Um, it's been, you know, uh, there are certainly plenty of things I could do better, a better job of as far as marketing and whatever, and, and to build it up even more of that sort of thing. But listen, the bottleneck is time and it's space. Yeah. And, uh, I don't, so I do everything out of my home. My partner does everything out of my home. Uh, you know, yeah. if I wanted to build any larger, I would need a facility and I don't know yeah. that I want to go down that road. Yeah. Every and I, I only have as much time, you know, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I'm always scheming about how to get bigger and do that sort of thing. But at some point, you just have to stop and just say, like, like, look, I only have so much time. Like, I don't, I don't want it any bigger. Yeah, it's practical. you got to get practical with yourself, no matter how much you love this shit. You got to get practical because yeah. eventually, right. reality is going to hit you in the face, no matter what. And then, even from a business perspective, like scaling up is not always the answer. You know, right. it's like like with rodents in particular. Um, live rodent production is not a scalable business. You can get it to a point where it's cranking, but as soon as you go up, you're adding more employees, more feed, more margin for error. You could literally be making less of a profit. You know, if you if you build it that much bigger, uh, it's really crazy. But you know, I feel like being in a place where you you, you have a product that you know I call it a product. We're talking about live animals here. That is not readily available and the quality is there that's, that's a place to be like where you are with you know with the jamaican or like ed marino with the basins or whatnot you know or garrett hartle with his super dwarfs like to carve yeah. out that niche you know that's that's worth his weight in gold right there in, in my opinion well and i think mj you said something important too it's like you know if, if you were to bring on someone to help you out they have to live up to your level of expectation. And if you're building something really cool, like you guys have done with cold blooded cafe and whatever else, you know, there, there's a level of expectation for the quality of what you do and the quality of your animals and how you handle your business. And if you're going to have somebody on to help you out with that, uh, you know, they have to think like you, they got to act yeah. like you and they have they to do. have that same uh, so level hard. of standard that you do. And that's really hard to find. And that's, that's really, you know, I'm, I've been fortunate to find a partner who I see eye to eye with, you know, that's so, you know, dude, it's so important because like, you know, I get like, you know, I used to tell Forrest, I was like, you know, you know, lucky you are to have Steven. Like you, you realize how nuts that is because this kid's mind has no roof either. Like you give him, like you want to build more, he's yeah. going to do it too. Like he's going to influence you. See, when I got into this game, 
Um, I had a buddy of mine, Tony. We're still good friends, my boy Tony. Um, you know, he had chondros and got me into chondros. And then next thing you know, I had six chondros. He had two chondros. And next thing you know, I had 12 chondros. He had, and it started building. And then every time I was showing him, he would like almost look like a fear, like, oh man, you're doing too much. Like, like kind of telling me almost to chill out. And I'm just like, what? Like, chill out like no i have a vision for this bro like he's like all right man and basically i just kind of saw i saw you know bless his heart he's probably just looking out for me or he's being a low-key hater i don't know <laughs> i don't know but he was like man you better you better chill you better chill and this was like dude this is nothing compared to what it is now but it turned into like you know it, i kind of wish i had somebody who was like more i don't know like somebody who was more like you know, just eye to eye with me but you know he just didn't see it the way i saw it and i've I saw it the way it is now, like, and I, I still see it more beyond that, but it's so difficult to see somebody who literally sees stuff the way you see, especially with reptiles. Like not too many people are like, you know, it, the hobby's big, but you know, fuck, how many people have Stevens? Like, it's just not, it's not like, it's like a one in a lifetime opportunity. And I think it's like an omen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, okay. Whatever. I'm just saying, if there's anybody out there, they live in San Diego, and you're not weird, you know. <laughs> that's not the, everyone's weird. Yeah, <laughs> weird, okay. Forget I'm weird. it. I even said that. No, I, I'm just doing things by my. I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Anyway, uh, but yeah, man, that's that's sure, cool. okay. uh, your partner. Like I said, somebody. Now let's talk about your partner. Good friend of yours before the reptiles. Like, how did you guys meet? How did this partnership even begin? Well, it was kind of uh, we knew each other through field herping stuff. Oh, you what? know, and uh, and so we 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 got together that way, and uh, you know, just we were out field herping together, and you know, I stopped by his place at one point, and I saw he had some Mexican indigos, and that was the one like trimark on that I didn't have yet, so just got to chatting about all that, and he works as a biologist and in the zoo industry as well, and so, um, so you know, he knows the stuff and um, and brought an element to it that I you know hadn't really considered, and so. Um, we, we just, I mean, the other thing is too, is that we, you know, we're best of friends, but we also business is business, you know? And so there's, uh, you know, we, we merged our collections. We balanced it out. I mean, we looked at what I was bringing to the table, what he was bringing to the table and, you know, value it at all and got to like a 50% agreement on everything. And then, uh, you know, we, we, we made that deal early on. And so he has his role on what he does for the business and I have mine. And when we go to buy something, it's half the cash is, comes from him and half comes from me. And when we sell stuff, half goes to him and half goes to me. And you know, he doesn't even have to ask what we make. I just, you know, it's just, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a rare thing. So we're, we're, we're fortunate to be, uh, yeah. um, you know, to, to just philosophically line up with everything we do. Yeah. I mean, super truly the rarity of that in this hobby in business in general, but especially in reptiles, like I don't know if I've ever heard of a situation like that yeah. that works. Right. Yeah. Like it always How just long are you guys blows up. No, it's been about fifteen years. I well, there you're you go. Doing well, then. You know, there about <laughs> something like that. You know, we were we're doing well. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it's like anything else. You know, there there are people that you can be friends with, but maybe you don't want to travel with. You know, because being next to them all the time is you know can be a bummer. But you know, it's it's uh, just different levels on how it works. So we're pretty fortunate. So with uh with your guys' partnership, were, were there any interests that your partner had that like you kind of caught on to, and you know, like he drew you bit. into certain species and vice versa? A little bit. I mean, we we've really tried to keep it focused on just the Darmark on stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we occasionally bring in side projects here and there. There was a while where I was uh, doing like Muserana, for example, and Baron's Racers. If you're familiar with those, yeah, yeah those and, are sick. Um, that was kind of just something I really did. And he, you know, he didn't really have as much of an interest. So I just did it. And uh, he does a lot of tortoises, um, in which hasn't really been my thing. There are some projects that we share together, uh, you know, from a financial standpoint, but really that's kind of what he does, at, what he does at his place. That's his expertise. That's his market. So he kind of does that. And I manage the snake side. So um, we definitely have, you know, uh, a lot of very common interests, but there are things that he's into that I'm not and vice versa, you know, and um, every time we get into kind of a little side project together, you know, um, it's just kind of dabble around, playing around with this or that and see if we can figure it out. And uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but, you know, we, we still, 
stay true and just understand that our bread and butter is the, is the drum arc on genus. So that's really the core of all of it and everything else just sort of rotates in and around it just for fun. Staying true is one of the truest statements or sayings that anyone can possibly say in this world. You just got to stay true to your shit. It's so like, I don't, I just always love that saying, stay true, just stay true to your shit. Like, like basically trust the process. Like, well, business wise, it makes a difference too, especially in the reptile area is that there are so many cool things out there that you can have and work with and own. And, uh, and yeah. so it's really easy, especially when you're first getting started to get like super passionate about this or that or whatever else. The next Ridiculous. thing you know, you've got, you know, 30 different types of reptiles and you're trying to manage it all. And, you know, one of the things that we've, we've really, you know, really always tried to do is just keep our focus, you know, right on the drum mark on genus and then play around a little bit here and there, but you know, you can't do everything. Uh, and that the animals do better, you do better, your business does better if you're focused and known for a certain type of thing, you know, we did not follow that advice. <laughs> Thanks, Lord. Not everyone, not everyone does. And we, I think we're like, we, we got to be close to 100 species. Over at this 100, point. yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, at one point, Boris wanted to have the most amount of species. He wanted that's to not, that's no, that is nothing new to you guys. Okay. You guys been at that level with species and fucking, you yeah. know. So that's just, you guys, yeah. that's. That's a, that's a one-off right there, okay? <laughs> like, you know, everything it's has... It's a little crazy. You're just like... I'm sure. Oh, my God. There's so many species. Like, in the same room, we got, like, leopard I just gave him a hard time earlier about the way shit. the racks are set up. I'm like, it's like, ball python, ball python, scrub. And then, ball python, ball python, like, there's something else. I'm like, can we organize this better? Because... I don't ever see, to be nuts. I don't ever see Reptech or you know Kush reptiles ever keeping let's just say a handful of species. You guys will always have at least ten plus species. You know, what twenty plus species going on in your property? Yeah, there's like yeah, we got like eighteen abronia species. Alone. Right. There you go. Okay. So, <laughs> that kind of all counts as one though. You know, they're all pretty similar yeah. as far as care and breeding yeah, goes. So. That's true. Now let's just say, John. Okay, let's just space. Let's anyway, just, stop talking about us. John, we're let's, always here. let's just say, John, space was not an issue for you. Let's just say you, uh, space. You could do whatever the hell you want or right? money. with space, or money. Uh, right? Or money. What are some species you would love to add, or like what's something you might wouldn't be you wouldn't mind dabbling into, or maybe working with? It's that's easy for me. It's bolens. Hell yeah. yeah! I mean, no, no, no. Uh, nope. There's no question. I mean, that's 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 the one. I mean, it. Uh, Caliber. I uh, I've been fascinated those with those since forever. Um, when I was in college, I had some white lips, and I I love those and just the look of just the the white on the face. And I've always been super into Bolin's pythons, but I could never justify spending the money when I was younger, just right. from a financial standpoint. A lot. And now that maybe I can afford it, yeah. I don't really want to spend the money because of space for right. one. Right. And two, if I do it, I want to do it right. And I'm sure you guys, you know, when you're talking about all the different species that you do and all that, I mean, if I'm going to have it, it's not going to be, it's, if I'm going to spend that kind of money on it, I'm going to want to be productive and successful with it. Yeah. And I don't have the time and space to dedicate towards figuring that enigma out because mm -hmm. it's not the easiest thing as I'm sure you know, but, but clearly, I mean, that's, if if time and money and space were no issue for me, that would be number one on my list. I hear you. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, now, have you handled any bullens? Have you had your time to even you know mess around with them in person, or do you have do you know somebody who's working with them nearby, maybe in San Diego, or uh, you know a, a little bit, but not really. Uh, you know, I've I've hung out with a couple adults, which is unbelievable, and uh, you know a couple babies here and there, but. You know, for as much as I've just sort of been fascinated with them since I was a kid, I, I haven't really actually interacted with them personally uh, all that much. It's just sort of been something just kind of have off to the side, and it's super cool. Part of it is I just <laughs> I don't know that I want to be tempted that much, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. They're neat animals for sure. Do you know who Ari is? Ari Flagle. Yeah, we've talked a little bit uh, here and there. I listen. I mean, I bought his book. Uh, you know, I have all the books on Bones Pythons. I, I messaged Ari a little bit uh, after reading his book and gave him some of my feedback on it. And 
which was all positive. Uh, I also had a, some good fortune to be able to travel to New Guinea uh, wow. many years ago. And I, you know, I didn't see wow. a Bolins in the wild, obviously. But what I appreciate about his book, I don't know if you guys have read it, but uh, I have twice. The, uh, I, I really appreciated the cultural component to it because hanging out in New Guinea with some of the tribal people up there was super awesome for me. And so to be able to read that part was where it extended beyond the reptile stuff was what I thought was super cool. Yes. Oh yeah. I have, I have my keynotes. I might want to go over real quick if you guys. Yeah, have. there it is. Um, you so, have some uh, sticky notes in there. I do. Yeah. So bring uh, you back to college. I'm just kidding. I mean, I do. <laughs> I just wanted to you, pretend like I super nerd out on books, and I really don't. But this is one book that I read a lot. Um, yeah. Can I get it on audio book? <laughs> can I please get that in an audio book? Hey, Ari, if you're listening, can you like narrate your book? Yes. Um, audible. Well, one thing, though, that if you did get bull and I, you'd be ready for that most Python keepers kind of freak out about is they shit like a dry mark on. Um, right. right. So most Python keepers like, okay, maybe once a week, you know, every other week, we're not feeding a lot. And with bull, it's like right. three times a week, disgusting, you know, very indigo-like right. that way. So I think, yeah. I think you're ready. Yeah, well, I think you're that's, ready. <laughs> that's a problem you got to be able to solve. Yeah. Now, your... go ahead, Des. Um, I was going to ask, what's the breeding protocols like? Like, do you do food cycling or temp cycling or yeah. for the drum archon? Yeah. Uh, well, it, you know, when you when you contrast them with other colubrids, one of the major differences is yeah. is that they're winter breeders, not spring yeah. breeders. So rather than cooling and then warming up and then pairing them when it's warm in March or whatever, uh, you know, you, you're pairing these up in November. Uh, that's really the month that, uh, that um, you know, where I get most of the pairings. And uh, so cooling wise, you know, um, I'll, I'll bring the snake room down 10 degrees or so. I'm not getting it super cold. Um, but, um, you know, I'll let it drop into the 60s at night and that sort of thing. And, um, Nice. And, uh, you know, really when it first starts getting cold and sometimes even in October, I'll let seasonal uh, elements play into how I pair as well. They'll tend to be uh, more likely to pair on that really first cold front that we get coming in in October, November. You know, that first storm that comes in, there's something to a barometric pressure change yeah. that will get them more likely to pair up, uh, that kind of thing. So that's one of the major differences is being winter breeders. Dude, I, I was I wanted to kind of share with you on that, John. I mean, we have some really awesome breeding weather in, in Southern California. Like, I love this is like probably. I mean, I'm not a fan of California, like law wise and stuff like that, you know. But uh, as far as weather wise and stuff, and keeping and keeping stuff at ambient and not, I mean, because I don't use much heat, like unless something's gravid or something like that. But I mean, it's only maybe a, a few months out of the year that I'm actually needing to to put out heat or heat up a room. Um, you know, to, to make sure these animals are good. Is that kind of like for you too? Yeah. And when you talk about like what you guys were saying about keeping different species and all that sort of thing, you know, one of my keys is I don't really want to keep something that has drastically different care than in, yeah. you know, that if I can kind of keep them all in the same room with all in the, sort of the same setup, um, that is, uh, that, that's one of my criteria when I'm looking at kind of a, a, a side project. I don't want to have yeah. something that's going to need, you know, a basking spot at 98 degrees, you know, yeah. uh, in, in general, the drum arc on, in general, the drum arc on genus, they don't like hot temperatures at all, you know? So my challenge is generally more keeping things cool enough rather than hot enough, you know, and in the heat of the summer, you know, this weekend, whatever, it's going to be hundred five degrees here. Yeah. You know, I don't want my temps to be above 80, you know? So, um, I, I try to manage ambient temperatures rather than, you know, heat pads or heat tape yeah. or anything like that and uh yeah. you know if i generally can keep my temperatures in the high 70s low 80s then i'm in i'm in good shape but in the winter time that i mean in the summer rather that's the the biggest challenge is not heat it's cool i, I want to i got to keep it cool yeah yeah 100 i think you know i mean san diego so we don't really get 105 i mean shoot we get i mean we'll get like 90s for sure but we don't get into the hundreds, not even close. Um, and then our nighttime only gets to like 50 or something. So and I think it's, yeah, weather's awesome here. Um, yeah. And not like Indy. You guys have to fuck. You guys, there's a whole protocol for your shit. 
it's like yeah, yeah exactly yeah. super up and down like you know like especially like march like right don't i mean because doesn't it kind of get warmer and then it gets all of a sudden cold again there, there were some weeks where it's like you know 70 40 raining 70 again you know it's fucked yeah it's all over <laughs> the place it's not consistent so the winters like they're notorious for um potholes here because it'll snow and then like the next day it all melts and the ground gets soft again and it's just like the roads are all totally messed up around here what's the uh, incubation process on those eggs like what's the, how many days and all that good stuff uh there are definitely some differences than you would a corn snake or a milk snake or whatever else um first off they don't just like the snakes, the eggs don't tolerate high temperatures. So you 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 generally are incubating in the you know mid seventies, okay. seventy six, seventy seven degrees, something like that. Damn. Uh, rather than you know, I mean, I I used to incubate my hunter and milk snake eggs at like eighty two. If you do eighty two, you're gonna have messed up babies. So uh, again, that's kind of the challenge, you know, in the in the summertime when it's hot out and I'm trying to incubate my eggs, I got to keep them cool enough. Yeah, you know, is part of the issue. I mean, I've, I used to keep, uh, I used to do all my eggs in an old refrigerator, just an old busted up metal box that I would keep in my in my garage. And, uh, you know, in the hot part of the summer, I'd be putting ice packs in there, yeah. you know, to try to keep to try to keep it. Now I'm a little bit more dialed in, but yeah, to try to keep it cool enough. But uh, in general, with drum arc on eggs, you you want them to be uh, a little cooler. The incubation period generally goes longer. You're usually around 100 days. Um, you know, and, and it can really fluctuate just a one or two degree difference in your incubation can really change your incubation period. It could be as little as 90. It could be as I've had eggs go over 130 days, uh, which is stressful because you, you know, you're expecting them to pop at a hundred and they, you know, takes a while longer, but, um, but yeah, so it, it takes, uh, you know, three, sometimes four months, uh, to hatch out the eggs. Um, in general, you want your vermiculite or whatever it is that you're using to be drier than most other colubrids. Um, I, I've never actually measured that out as far as ratio of like vermiculite to water kind of thing. It's just more of a feel thing. Right. But um, uh, you generally want it to be just almost barely even, barely even wet at all. Um, you know, you'd rather have the humidity. Uh, but you don't want them in contact with the moisture. And I learned that the hard way. Like a lot of things I learned is that, you know, if you have too much humidity in your egg box, the eggs absorb the water and they'll swell even to the point where they're burst sometimes, uh, you know, which is a, which is a bummer. So, uh, you know, drier substrate, uh, they're big eggs, the eggs, particularly towards the end of the incubation, they breathe, uh, more. So you want to have some ventilation in there and you want to have air in your egg box for them to be able to, to breathe. You can suffocate them pretty easily as well. So for me, the keys have just been a little drier, a little cooler and a little more air than most eggs. And you're going to be in good shape. Wow. That's wild. That's different. Yeah. Right. Steven? We, yeah. typically, we typically put no holes in the egg box at all. Like, you know what I mean? There's right. And then uh, with those scrub eggs, actually I gave them a good amount of ventilation the whole time. I think that was actually yeah. beneficial, but yeah, most maybe the typical Python, you know, protocol is as little ventilation as possible. Try to keep like you know, hundred percent humidity. Um, yeah, that's, sure. that's definitely different for sure. Because I mean, let's Stephen. It was kind of like you said. It was a little more different. I mean, hatching these scrubs were it's different ball game from the other snakes that you've hatched before, right? Um, yeah. Lower heat. I mean, lower obviously. heat, longer, yeah. just more finicky eggs. Yeah, you know, nine, ninety day incubation. Here in one thirty, I'm like shit. I was I was shaking around day eighty five. I couldn't imagine waiting one thirty. Like you know, yeah. that would suck. But uh, yeah, but no, it's it's super interesting. I I feel like these the dry marcon from like a breeding perspective, like they kind of take aspects of like python breeding and colubrid breeding, and you know, just like a lot of put different schools of thought. Yeah. Put them all together, and you have this one, you know, kind of more right. complex breeding scheme. It's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So do you? Is there any sort of brumation type period with them at all, given that you're breeding them into the fall? Or uh, I I do I do intentionally lower the temperatures, you know. But again, I you know I'm only dropping it, you know, ten or fifteen degrees. Yeah. Inst interestingly enough, um, the eastern indigos are the ones that I generally will cool even more, 
I didn't do it this year, but uh, in, in previous years, I'll even put my my Easterns outside uh, for really the winter. Ranger, and right? yeah, obviously, I'm not in India, uh, Indianapolis, but yeah. uh, you know, putting them putting them outside here, and it's you know, I've had I, I had a pair once. They they were locked up for over 24 hours, and it was 50 degrees mm -hmm. outside, and that's that that worked for them awesome. And my clutches were great that that, that year. So mm -hmm. sometimes um, you know. Breeding them when they're extra cool, you know, can help. John, what year was it when you hatched your first, uh, like you got your first clutch and you hatched out those indigos? Oh, man. Oh, probably 2006, 2007, something like that. Were you this happy? <laughs> <laughs> probably. Were you this happy? Oh, Did you look like a 12-year-old staring at this Christmas present? <laughs> That's the price probably. of the I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I mean, that's what it's all about right there, right? Chase I mean, I, I was that happy. I had, I had more facial hair. Now. You, you said you had facial hair? Yeah. Yeah. Steven, Steven's, Steven's like at least 20 years out before facial hair, I think. So nah, I don't think my dad can grow facial hair. He tried. Dude's like 60, so I'm fucked. Teach your own on the facial hair, man. It's all good. Um, no, man, that's so 2006, you got your first hatchlings, and then I'm sure that did something to you, right? I'm, that was kind of like a. I'm, <laughs> Well, to, to, to segue into the kind of the, the next natural part of the conversation would be the babies. Uh, I mean, that was a steep, steep learning curve because uh, getting baby drum archon established is not an easy task. Oh, shit. And, you know, okay. anything that I bred prior to that point was specifically and consciously chosen as things that are going to feed well. You know, I didn't want to do Alterna or anything like that because I didn't want to be scenting with lizards and whatever. So that's why I was doing the Honduran milks and whatnot. But, you know, when I, I had my first clutch of 20 plus, you know, black tail Kribos, uh, you know, I had to learn real fast. You know, I had to learn real fast. And I had, uh, I made the mistake at that point of, you know, accepting deposits from people on eggs that hadn't even hatched yet. And that was stressful, man, to, have, to be holding other people's money and not really know what I was doing with the babies. And there was just an enormous amount of pressure with that. Uh, but you learn fast, man. And part of the problem with baby drum archon is that, you know, in the wild, indigos and kribos are so generalist with what they'll eat. They'll eat fish, frogs, lizards, birds, whatever it is. And sometimes as babies, you just don't know what they want. Right. And, um, you know, we could debate this as a separate issue, but people in the pet trade, you know, they want things that eat rodents because uh, that's what's easy for them. And yeah. so that was always kind of the, and still is today, I want my babies to be feeding well on rodents before, before I send them off to a new home. So you learn about scenting and you learn about scenting with different types of items, fish, frogs, birds, quail, whatever it is, you know, other snakes. And, um, you know, nothing's more frustrating than having a thousand dollar snake that you can't get to eat. <laughs> 100%. You know what's crazy about the rodent thing? Not only do they want the snake to eat rodents, they want the rodents to smell good before they feed it off. Am I right, <laughs> It's a constant complaint at Cold Blooded Captain. Yeah. <laughs> they want like, one of them smell like, like lavender, yeah, like a, a, a fresh, you know. We're going to start Sunday. sending air fresheners in our boxes. It's like, oh, my rodents smell like dead rodents. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, yeah. Damn, <laughs> what it is. Sorry? Like, we're not a we're not a live rodent company. Yeah, we, we don't sell you frozen live rodents. Like uh, they don't smell that good either. So like, I don't um, know what you want. Okay, wait. So so we had some Texas indigos for a minute, but uh -huh. I had a I had one get out, uh -huh. and it was in the summertime, and she was gone for like at least a month. I, I'm sure you not. She came back, and when she came back, we like soaked her and we're like worried about her and everything, and she started throwing up garter snakes. <laughs> yeah, like she just that. went on a frenzy. That's pretty cool. And She's I just out in your yard, macking on all the local garden. Well, we have a five-acre property, and then we have the rodent barn. And I think she just like she just bounced for like a month. Like someone left the tub open, she got out. Like she got because we, we were keeping them in the like walkway of our barn, so there was an area we could keep reptiles. And so the door was probably open. I don't know. Mistakes happen, but this snake just like left for like a month. Like she just. She probably went 60 miles or some shit and just yeah. went everywhere. And then one day I was cleaning and I hear my dog barking outside and I go out there and here she is just rolling through the grass. I'm like, no way. And I get her back and I'm like, okay, she's probably just dehydrated. I, I bet. And so I soaked her and then 
next thing you know, she's just throwing up all these garter snakes. And that's I'm funny. Like, what have you been doing out here? Like, it's wild. That's funny. Yeah. Was, right. yeah they, they love snakes. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like, so my buddy Miguel Garcia, he uh, he's a you know he's a big ball python breeder, but he has a uh, he has a a red indigo, and he basically always feeds off his like whatever ball python hatchings are like on their way out. And uh, holy shit, every video that he posts is of that snake eating a, a, a ball python. It's probably it just never gets old. Like how yeah. quickly they devour it. Like it's uh, yeah, it's so like it's kind of like uh. It, it, it's it's breathtaking, man. You, you sit back and you go. It's almost like watching a rat eat, you know, a snake eat a rat for the first time. You know, it's like, wow, okay. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, what's cool too is that is that when you work with species that eat different things in the wild, yeah, uh, it's kind of fun to watch their response when you offer different things. And you know, I might have raised a snake on only rodents, and then all of a sudden, when it's three years old, I'll offer it a snake or something, and that it, you can see them thinking about it, like, whoa, that's a new smell I have, and then. But, you know, when you offer in some different types of things, you know, you, you can get uh, you can get a sense that, you know, this is uh, this is their preferred prey item. You know, they'll eat the mice. Yeah. They're happy to eat the mice, but they they love snakes, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, no offense to the rodent breeders in the room. But uh, you know, I think there are there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of reptiles that are just would just be you know happy as can be to never eat a rodent. Oh yeah. Why is it, why isn't there why isn't there and I'm sure I mean there I could probably find the reason why but I mean don't you think a person who produces snakes to get eaten by snakes would do pretty well maybe? The person to get eaten by snakes, like for instance, like I produce normal pythons, so they could be. Uh, I could sell them to people who have crebos or like you know other snakes that thrive off eating other snakes. Like you know what I mean. I think the main reason that wouldn't work so great is that most snakes like that would produce maybe once or twice a year, where like a female rat will produce like once a month. So like. That's a lot. Yeah. You, return, a lot of on the, you know, feeder snakes that you're probably selling for 10 bucks. I wouldn't be there. So yeah. from a business perspective, if I don't work right. with really good at Right. Snakes. I mean, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to pay 20, 30 bucks for a, for a meal. Uh, yeah. You know, but it, but, you know, but when you're, when you're trying to get your baby snake started, it, it helps to have some stuff. I mean, there was a, oh, yeah. Listen. a time when I was breeding Muserana, which is another type of colubrid that, that, are more hardwired to eat snakes than right. even indigos. And, uh, and you know, I would go buy house geckos from an importer that was near here. And there was a, you know, they had in some ribbon snakes that they, that they'd imported or whatever, had some wild caught ribbon snakes or whatever. And they just dumped a litter of babies. So I bought up all the babies, you know, five bucks each or whatever it was and throwing them in. I mean, I'd throw in little baby ribbon snakes with a baby indigo that it had not eaten in like three months, you know, and they just went berserk. I mean, chased them around the cage, just went absolutely bonkers uh, trying to chase these things down. And, you know, it's that moment when you realize that, hey, I don't need to be feeding my snakes rodents all the time. They they would love to not eat rodents and, and eat other stuff. That's so cool. So yeah. with that, did you have issues with breeding, like the females eating the males or anything like Good that? Good question. Good question. Um, it doesn't very, it, it happens very, very seldomly where you'll have a, a food aggression problem during your pairings. But what will happen, and um, you know, other colubrids will do this too, is that the male will bite the female to hold her down, you know, and that, right. that's not an uncommon yeah. thing, right? right. But yeah. when you have teeth and jaws that are as strong as indigos are, it can be a major problem, okay. uh, uh, like a major problem. It's something I struggle with every year. And I have a couple individual males that, uh, are hard to control. Uh, and we're talking sutures, stitches, you know, death. Um, I mean, it, it can be an issue because they will really mess up the females, not out of a, a place of, um, uh, of wanting to eat them, but just being really aggressive with trying to breed to them. And they're just so strong. Their jaws are so strong and their teeth are so sharp. It can really mess them up. That's scary to think about because it trips me out because I, I don't have indigos, you know, but something that reminds me, you know, I've, I've interacted with Miguel's and I, you know, I've seen a lot of 
indigos on videos and stuff. And something that reminds me so much of those are the false water cobras. But false right. water cobras are – that's a different species completely. But I feel like they're not. Like I swear to God they're not. Like there's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've never kept falsies, but I, but I, from what I hear, they're, they're really similar to, uh, to indigos and stuff. Are you there, John? Uh, yes. Is okay. it, are you not seeing me? Yeah, it's cool if you don't. You're, you're, you're just on, you're on some jo uh, Joe Switalski stuff right now. He does the same thing. He doesn't show his face. So if you, <laughs> oh, no, it's, hang on. Let me, let me figure this out. I think your phone maybe went on silent or not silent, but, uh, you can't hear me or you can't see me? No, 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 no. I can hear you. I just can't see you. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. How's that? Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. Okay. All right. Back. But, but yeah, what's your, I mean, do you know anything about false water cobras? I mean, because I know, I mean, I have I don't two. really. Okay. Shit. Um, all, I, all I know is what I hear. And what I hear is that they're very indigo like yes. in how you take care of them and, how, and their food response and that sort of thing. Man, literally, um, I had me go over at my house, and he kind of saw how mine acted, and he's like, "Holy crap! Like that's exactly how mine acts." I'm like, "I know," um, but then I I also heard that they're a handful when it comes to breeding. So, um, you know, and I'm actually gonna be pairing mine up this year. So it's like, oh shit, stitches and all that sounds fun, you know? Fuck. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that I've heard of false water cobras biting to that degree, but uh, but I don't know. I find I out. Know. We'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. Throw them together. Uh, that's that's I, okay. One thing that's like we'll find out is always something that stands out to me, John, because uh, Stephen okay. is my go-to guy when I feel like something's either going to go really, really bad and or something, whatever. Right. So I remember Stephen. I I fed my emerald a rat pup for the first time, and it ate it in my. My emerald my little neon not neon it's a juvie, but man, his stomach was big, and I was like, he wasn't really perched all the way, and I was like. I fucking do. This is not good. Typically, you know, emeralds, I guess, you know, they, they regurg real easily, but not a healthy one. But regardless, I called Steven and uh, told him and I thought he was going to say something like, well, you're good or something. Chill out. But he was just like, well, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> or he, he, no, no. He said, no, I guess we'll find, I guess this is not the time we'll find out if that's a he healthy emerald or not or something it's like that. Healthy. It's Try a good it's but, it's healthy. Yeah. And, and it made it that fucking thing held it down really good so it's a healthy animal hello right. so either way i think that's awesome man that you've kind of uh i mean but what's not awesome is it a year thing that you have to go through this when breeding the uh the indigos like as far as them you know because you said you have males that you just can't males yeah. can't really chill out and and you, you still there, i mean it's I, I don't make it sound like it's a common thing um there are a couple individuals that i have that right. are a problem every year <laughs> uh, but the vast majority are not a problem. But you know, some some males are a little, you, you know, even, it, even in humans, they're a little bit too alpha. You know, <laughs> a little too des. Hey, sorry, <laughs> she's what the, what the what's the female alpha? What's yeah, it called? Yeah. Um, no, I was just wondering, do you have to like separate, like pull them apart, or you just let them yeah. do their thing? And oh then no, it, it's there. it's you you can't let them bite at all. I mean, it, I, I supervise, and if he gets in a bite, um, you know, while, while I'm watching, I have to separate him immediately because, uh, I mean, I, I've had, you know, uh, we, we had a female Eastern a couple of years ago. I, I don't know how she lived through it. I mean, it was it was bad. I thought her head was going to fall off. I mean, it was down to the bone, the whole thing. Uh, but uh, she, 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 she turned it around, but you know, you feel bad subjecting the females to some of these males. So I, I try not to, um, you know, and when I do, I try to really look out for it, but you know, again, it's, it's not a super common problem. It's just a couple individuals really. Yeah. I thought it was crazy when corn snakes would do it. And like, especially the like, scaleless ones. Cause yeah. There. But there's not, no not much protection. Corn. Like, what are they doing? MJ, I had a lot of corn snakes, okay? I just love we're going, we're talking, we're comparing corn snakes to indigos, right? <laughs> the only corn I've ever really worked with, okay? I, I know nothing about these things. I, I had a pair of Texas indigos, but so many messed up information. Not it's Steven, not me. Not Steven, a different not Steven. Not and, not I not Steven's was. and I really want some more. And after being on Instagram, I kind of want those little Texas ones with the red. Yeah, I like uh, that. Yeah, no, we're talking about we're talking about you want indigos, you want corn snakes again. I want Texas, I, I want Mexican uh, indigos. 
The, the Mexican in Well, you can get those and then breed corn snakes to feed to them. I don't, yeah, exactly. exactly. See, exactly. I got rid of my corns, okay? There, there's Dude, that's that's gonna get that's gonna get your TikTok up, hella. Corn I know, they, I think they take that down, like this one. They sure. did. It's I over. don't think they would allow. Yeah, it's uh, a real high red herbivorous. I like that one. Cool. Closer. Yeah, I, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I want. Yeah. I want that so Can bad. I get some of those, John. He Say does. That again? Can I get some of those? Sure. Jeez. Okay. Like, here's my PayPal. I'll take two point two. <laughs> two point two. Yeah. Oh my lord, that easy, huh? But so hold on, real quick. Um, it's not it, okay now. If I were to come across your Instagram and I'm like, man, I want to buy a snake from this guy. What is the protocol for that? So I change it up this year, and uh, uh, so we'll we'll see how it ends up going when I actually start uh, selling this year's offspring, but. Uh, what I was experiencing was that uh, in the past that uh, I had sort of a, a, a pseudo waiting list that what I would do when people would email me, I would keep a folder in my email inbox of all people that were interested. And then when I had stuff to offer, I would just send an email out to everybody on my list. And then it was sort of first come first serve. And what was happening is that there were people that were waiting for a year, two years, whatever to get a snake. And they just didn't respond in time because sometimes these things that I mean they'd be sold out in forty eight hours. Like, yeah. Um, sure. So uh, I did it differently this year. So this year I created uh, a more structured waiting list, and so on my website uh, I wrote out all of what I would envision the terms of service to be, and that would be that if you give me a hundred bucks, that you can get on the waiting list in the order in which I receive it, the inquiry, and when I have snakes to offer, that I go in order off of that list. Yeah. And I never wanted to do that in the past because I felt like the longer you've been on my list, the least, the less likely you are to actually show up with money two years later. And I felt like it was something of a waste of my time. But then there are people that have genuinely be, been waiting for a long time and they just get passed over. So um, I've done it that way. And I try to make it clear that it's not really about the money. You know, the hundred dollars goes towards whatever animal you're buying. Right. Um, and, you know, if you're a repeat customer with me, I tell I tell people you don't need to pay me at all. Just tell me what you want and I'll put you on the list in order. And so hopefully that'll mean that there are going to be less people that miss out. And that when I do have uh, when I do start offering this year's babies that I can just go on number one on my list, number two on my list and work my way down and uh, everything will go like that. So. If someone finds me on Instagram or whatever else, and they ask me, hey, what's your availability? Can I buy stuff from you? I'll generally say, you know, read the terms of service on my website. And if you agree to all of it, um, you know, then we can proceed. Um, but, you know, I, I can't guarantee that someone's going to get the animal they're looking for that year because who knows? You know, I have infertility issues or whatever else might happen. I might have 30 people wanting to buy a snake that I only have 20 of, you know. And so everyone's just got to hopefully understand and agree where I'm coming from with the list and to be able to agree to all the terms on it. But uh, so far it's been, uh, it's been well responded to. I've got a big long list of people um, that are waiting for, you know, the various species and uh, we'll see when it comes time for people to actually uh, come up with the rest of the money, if they're still going to be there as a buyer. But um, uh, it seems to be, seems to be going well so far. I'll, have more info once I start selling. Yeah. Hey, John, can you do me a solid, please? And, and, and no pressure. You could just, yeah. you know, whatever. You could say no to this. But eventually, list-wise, right, ladies first, clearly, we'll put Desiree on there, right? But can you just put me right there, yeah. right behind her? Like, I'm talking about, even if, like, put Steven after me. I'm talking about right there next to Desiree, where it's almost we're the same. Next to her or just a little below? I'd say send, put right there next to her and send the text at the same time. And, and then whoever responds whoever, first and shows up with money, out, yes, okay. more likely it's going to be her. But still, you know, out of I um, also can send you rodents too for a Ah, you get paid. It's there's cash or rodents or both. Well, listen, with uh, <laughs> with, with a couple hundred indigos, you need yeah, a lot of rodents. <laughs> yeah, smile. I got. Um, no, man. Because listen, I told you before we went live. This is a dream species of mine. Her and I, we're not window shoppers. We'll buy it. So right. please put us on the list. Uh, I mean, I would really, 
I mean, and not. I literally didn't realize how many different like colors and things of these indigos there are in the creek. How do you say that? Creebo. I seen oh. them recently at the Reptarium with Brian and handled them a little bit. But like the indigos are amazing. I always like those, and we only had the two Texas ones. But I just went through your Instagram earlier. I was, you know, I just fell in love with these Mexican ones. Like I gotta have those now. Like I, I'm, right on. I'm gonna like dream about them. So mm. if we yeah. could just, if you could just put me on the list for those, just those. Even if it's right just there, but I would like two pairs. But I Fine. really, really, really like those. <laughs> I'm a color. I need I two pairs. Red, like now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I could get the stopping in my Air Force one. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that's. I want to. I want to. I'm sorry. I want to talk about Kribos now, man. If you don't mind. Go. Um, monsters, bro. Those are another monster species. They don't play around. Those are those eat snakes as well. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, uh, they they all eat the same thing, you know. And it's in and and by that I mean anything. Like it just, uh, it doesn't matter. They'll, they'll eat in the wild. They'll eat anything. They'll eat baby alligators, baby turtles. It doesn't matter. They'll eat anything. And so, uh, yeah, they're, they're cool. So yeah, that's a yellowtail Kribo there. Uh, those are from, those are from South America. And uh, yeah, they, my, uh, you know, on average, I think they're all sort of the same. Um, the yellowtails are probably uh, can get a little longer but are on average are a little bit more slender, but really not by much. It's really kind of all the same. Um, uh, the, the yellow tails can get big. My largest snake in my whole collection is my big old adult male yellow tail. Uh, his name's Orion and he's, he's, he's over eight feet, eight and a half. I mean, these, these have an attitude too, right? I mean, I don't know how docile yours are, but I've seen some that people, you know, get in and they do, they don't, they don't play, man. They look like there's some serious work. Well, the deal with that is, is in general, really all of them are pretty chill and, and people will say indigos are like intelligent, you know, whatever that means. And part of that for me is just that, is that they figure out pretty quickly if you're a threat or not. And they figure out pretty quickly if they're being fed or not. And, uh, you know, when they're feeling comfortable and secure, they're, they're super chill snakes. But if they think they're going to get fed, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta be on your toes for sure. Oh man. This is I, such an easy species to fall in love with. I kind of like, yeah, I'm really liking that one. I don't know, man. You're, you, I, this is a dangerous, dangerous thing, a dangerous move bringing you on right on, on yeah, sure. rodents for years. That's right. Oh, I'm yeah, like, I'm tripping out. <laughs> Because I've seen these snakes from people getting in. I mean, th these are imported a lot, right? The yellowtail is the most. Yeah, the yellowtails are the most because uh, Guyana and Suriname are the countries that you know you see a lot of the South American imports for, coming from, and they're native to there. So you'll see you'll see yellowtails coming in a lot. Temperament wise, you know, there's a big difference between wild caught and captive bred with yellowtails. Um, you know, to get an adult wild caught yellowtail um is uh can be a challenge uh from a temperament standpoint but you know if you get a baby a baby captive bred they can be they can be pretty chill um, um are you have a question MJ? no go ahead steven okay um so you know across the board um how many different like variations uh, you know color and pattern wise be it genetic or locality based are you looking at in each species uh, you know, the, the one that's the most variable is the Mexican. So Des, you were talking about the red ones, for example, um, you know, they're, they're one of the lesser known in the pet trade and, and they've, uh, been a lot more prominent in the pet trade in the last couple of years. They really weren't, weren't around much, um, you know, uh, a few years ago, but their range is really pretty wide in Mexico. They can almost be, you know, up to the U S up in Sonora in the northern parts of the West Coast, and then they come all the way down and even bend in a little bit towards Veracruz around Mexico City. So yeah, they have a very, very large range in the wild. And so with that, there's some a lot of locality-based color variation. So we initially were working with some that were uh, very black, but then also had a very white throat and a very white belly. 
Um, and those caught on a lot. And then we were able to get our hands on some of the ones that have that reddish coloration, which is from a different locality, um, which is super cool. So um, we try to keep a breeding group of kind of all the different looks. And yeah. then within that breeding group, try to keep the genetics as diverse as possible as far as inbreeding and whatever else. So um, it really kind of depends. Unicolors, for example, unicolor Kribos, um, you know, there aren't that many different phenotypes. There's just kind of different shades of the tail. So, uh, you know, that's a little bit more of a condensed breeding group, but you talk about the Mexicans, we've got a, a breeding group of red ones. We've got a breeding group of black and white ones. We've got a, another breeding group of ones, um, that are more from Veracruz that are, get larger and maybe aren't as white as the Sonoran ones. So, um, it, uh, it kind of depends on the type, but mm -hmm. the Mexicans are the most diverse for sure. And then from a genetic perspective, are the Azanthics and the Blacktails the only like morph, so to speak, you know, like a genetically reproduced look? Uh, yeah, I mean, they're the ones that are available in the pet trade, really. You, you see auto animals popping up here and there yeah. um, and, and how verifiable they are as far as what they are and whether or not it's a genetic trait or not. You know, I don't know. There was sort of a, a piebaldish looking Eastern Indigo that popped up a while back. I don't know that that's been a proven trait yet. Uh, I've, I've seen what someone's claiming to be an albino Eastern Indigo in Europe. I don't know what that is, uh, if that's really been proven yet. Um, I have uh, just acquired a yellowtail Kribo that's Xanthic. Okay. Um, but, you know, I haven't bred it out yet and haven't produced Xanthic babies yet. So there's along that lines. But the Xanthic blacktails are really the only morph that has been proven to be genetically inheritable to my knowledge and is uh, readily available in the, in the pet trade. Mm -hmm. Then the, the red with the, um, the Eastern Indigos, is that a similar thing like with the, the Rubidus where it's a locality based thing? What's, what's that? How does that work? With you know, the I actually don't know too uh, enough about the localities of how they look in the wild, whether you not, you get at the black phase or the red phase, if that's a locality thing, but, uh, there's, there, there's the red phase, which you call a red throat. They've got red on the face and on the throat. And then there's what I call the black phase where there's not really any red and there's some white, you know, on the chin or going down the throat a little bit. Those are the, kind of the two different looks, whether or not it's a locality thing. I don't know. Uh, it's not a morph thing. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's just a range of phenotypes. So, um, you can breed a red phase to a black phase and get some of both. You can breed two reds together and still produce a black baby uh, and vice versa. So um, that's just kind of a, a phenotype. We were talking about Orion earlier, right? Uh, I mentioned him, yeah. Okay. And for you guys to get an understanding on Orion, um, I mean, he's he's like, he's your pride and joy, right? I mean, he's, 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 a, he's, a, he's a big boy. He's, uh, he, he's a snake. He's my largest. That's Orion. And... Uh, <laughs> He's one that, um, That's long. you know, probably is getting close to retirement age, but okay. he's one that will just never leave my house. Like, uh, it, uh, I'm just totally in love with that snake. That snake is, like, he is thick, bro. Like, I'm talking about, like, you know, his, he's lean, lean. He's not, like, Burmese thick. He's just, like, super, like, muscular, like, no joke. Would not want to go there with that snake ever in my life. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, and he's not necessarily tame. Uh, he's mostly tame, but you know, he, you, you've got to treat him with respect or he'll let you know. Now what's your kind of, uh, what do you, you know, for people out there who want to wonder how does this guy know like his snakes? How does he, what's his like protocol when handling his snakes? Do you do something each time you open up an enclosure and, you know, let the snake know you're coming in or like, what do you, what do you do? Like, how does, uh, you know, you, you'd probably have to dig pretty deep on my Instagram to find it. I think it's in there, but, uh, the worst bite I ever took was many, many years ago from an Eastern Indigo. And I opened his enclosure and I was peeking in to see if he'd eaten his enclosure was I, and he jumped out and food response was right in my face. And all I just saw was just white gums going right towards my face. And I jerked back. And he got a hold of the tip of my nose and I pulled oh. back. And so it just shredded uh, my nose, just blood everywhere and whatever. There's a picture somewhere on the Instagram, I think. I'm looking. I'm looking. Uh, you know, but I, I, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, they've got super sharp teeth. 
super strong jaws and it's just not fun to get bitten. So I, I avoid it <laughs> at any cost really. Um, so my protocol when I'm handling them is, it is. is uh, they're really not going to bite you out of defense. It's going to be a food response. So just I like use a cage hook. I use a cage hook to pull them out. And once they're in my hands, they're, they're super chill. As long as they know they're not being fed, they're cool. Literally just like all the others, I feel like for the most part, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, there, there's some snakes that are pretty dumb. I mean, if they feel flesh, it doesn't matter what it tastes, what it smells like. They're going to, there it is. Yep. It, uh, it, put that away. I got a better shot than that. Oh, you can't... oh, oh okay. I'm good. Come on, man. Yeah, Dude, that's there's another one in there. Amateur hour. Amateur hour. Jeez, that's my. I'm the I'm the visual guy. Come on, there it is. Yeah, right there there. It is. Look how happy this guy is. Well, it was funny that's about that. I guess I was. The olive bite. Oh, jeez. I, I was happy that I was getting it documented. You know, I was screaming to my wife in the house, and she was you know worried for my safety. But she came out, and I was, you know, just uh, super happy. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. yeah. Dude. Um. And so that was on, like you said, that was the worst bite you've ever taken. You said, or yeah, with those. And, and I mean, I, you know, you, you get bit here and there, hopefully not by a large adult, but you know, uh, uh, with the big adults, even if they're a mellow snake, I usually use a cage hook to pull them out. And as soon as I get a coil in my hand, they know that it's done. They're not being fed and they're super chill. All mm -hmm. right. Quick round table. Steven, what's the worst bite you've ever gotten? Um, Dominican red mountain boa feed response by my thumb and it hit a nerve or something. Oh. Never had a feeling where it's like, just stop this feeling of me. Like, like my body was telling me to do whatever to get that off it. It yeah. hurt a lot and it stung for a few days. Yeah, that was a bitch of a bite. Desiree. Feed response ever. Uh, white caiman bite in the <laughs> finger. <laughs> uh, you got a finger yeah. in your finger? A and bite, yeah, I was like three foot. I was taping the mouth and um, it got me. Thank oh. God I let go. But I still have scarring there and I don't have feeling in that tip of my finger anymore. Her bite's worse than mine. Yeah, I did have my yeah. snake feeding response bite was from a, a giant olive python, but she bit me on the back of the shoulder and I was just laughing and I was training some new people. They were cleaning baby corn snakes and um, they saw that happen and they are just like, oh my God, what should we do? Should we call the cops? I'm like, no, just get over here and unwrap it. That was just funny because, you know, I've been working rodents all day and then the snake literally like comes out of her cage after me and she bites me in the back of the shoulder. It's on TikTok. It's got 2.7 million views now. Oh, wow. Well, but it, it was it was the security camera in the reptile room. That's where the video is off of. And Forrest was like, you need to put that on your TikTok. That should have been your first video. I was like, the quality sucks. But I listened to him and it just went viral. And I was like. All right. It still hit. It hit. Desiree's story clearly should have went last, but I got I got I got tagged. I, I, I got one right now from a black tree yesterday. Tip of tip of the day when you're working monitors, it uh it sometimes helps to have a second glove on your offhand. Whoops. In case it gets out of the first hand a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So I only had one glove monitor on. Monitor tip of the day. Two gloves. Yeah, you should always wear two gloves. I guess two gloves. Do you wear Do you wear gloves, uh, John? No. Yeah, I, I feel didn't have like that's true. Yeah, yeah. Monitors. Yeah. monitors I, would, I would have leather. I would have a leather suit on, right? <laughs> <laughs> and leather from head to toe. I would look that's like. Worst bite. Huh? Your worst bite. What? Oh, my worst bite was a twelve foot retic. Uh, that stupid I, I had rats out that that has been over like or that would have been falling out from the night before and i had this snake that was in a tub uh because he had bad stuck shed and i was so high that i didn't even really realize that like this guy's been smelling food this whole time so basically i just open up the tub i reached in there and i'm like oh all your shed come off but there's one that there's this one piece right by your neck let me just pull that off and yes. It was the worst. It, it literally got me. So it got my pinky, the inside of my pinky. That's where the teeth were. And it wrapped my arm. And I sat still. Like, I did the right thing. I didn't, you know, I just like, oh, shit, it got me. And I, I was able to get him off me. But my pinky pulled up. And I couldn't wear my pinky 
hockey ring for like two months. It was terrible. But I still don't have any feeling. I still have no feeling on this inside of my pinky. Yeah, every time I every time I fold it, it just feels. I don't know if you ever had any kind of like numbing from like a bite or anything, and you just like you could bend it, but it just feels like it's yeah. like sleep. It's weird. So that's all it does. I feel like it's a sleep still right here. It's kind of weird, but uh, bites gotta love bites, right? Yeah. Forest bite though. Or, yeah, I don't. Forest, I don't think I think you two would probably not even air our, our episode right now. I got, I got it. Got this, it. This guy had horrible bites. This is not for the faint of heart. If anybody yeah, has show it. it. You have a, a weak stomach. Look away for about five seconds. This is one of many though. And she's got wait, 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 wait. Oh god. Oh god. Steven. Who is that? Who is that? Yeah. You done? Okay, here we go. This is uh, 17 stitches. Um, that that was up. that was from a Cayman oh, product. Jeez, I don't want to look at that. <laughs> ah! I don't want to look at that. If, you have, if you have any crocodilians, that's, that's over why, about two and a half feet long. That's, that's why I couldn't. Be, that's why I couldn't be a fire fry, a, fi, a fryer, firefighter mm -hmm. because of shit like that. Like I just can't look at stuff like that. They make you go to EMT school and go to go on rides and shit, and I just can't look at stuff like that. I just can't, man. Yeah, that was a wild oh. day. I have to tell you what. Dude, but it's awesome for everybody who's watching. If you're not willing to risk that with some of these animals, like don't keep don't them. do it. Don't I keep mean, it. like big snakes, even you know, even dry marcon can they can mess you up, you know, big big snakes, monitor lizards, even tree monitors, like you gotta be ready be for surprised how bad a corn snake bite hurts from an adult breeder. Okay. Those little fuckers are corn mean. snakes, they're they're mean. Don't fuck with corn snakes. <laughs> fuck, I will fuck a corn snake up. Get fucking. <laughs> I feel like they've sneaked snuck their way into the conversation quite a bit here. <laughs> they have. Corn snakes. Okay. 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 Corn snakes are food. I, okay. I never thought I had all. Three dollar corn snakes. Let me just tell you what happened. Okay, so Forrest got this great idea one time, and he's like, "I'm buying a hundred adult." breeder corn snakes out of Europe, some guy, I don't remember, gets them in here. Then he's like, well, I'm going to buy about 20 scaleless males. And then this is your project, Des. So figure it out. And then I think he went on some world trip where he left. And I was stuck here with 100 adults trying to figure out how to breed these things. And I took a lot of bites. They, there were some angry ones in there. Like um, the, what's up, Carl? Is it, is it Carl Howard? Oh, keep going. so no, it was the uh, the red, the red ones. What were those called? Blood ones? Bloods. Yeah, the blood red ones. This one, she was just so angry every year, like every time, you know, she she did not want to let her oh, eggs go. She was evil, pure evil. Wow. Okay. But uh, so I did that for a few years and I, I had like the whole baby rack was full of 200 babies. And then I had a bunch of, um, of, you know those little sandwich delis that you put sandwiches in? Yeah. I had at least a hundred of those of babies too. A um, lot, lot of corn snakes um, for a while. And then uh, I just sold them all to the bar checks and now they're doing it. So. Wow. Uh, on the topic of babies, uh, what's like your approximate uh, production in a year at, with all the species? Like how many offspring do you look at in a typical year? Uh, I'm generally around 200 to 250. Damn, that's not bad. Yeah, all right. So, and then this kind of leads, I have a question leading to another question. So uh -huh. you've been doing this for a while. At, at this point, what amount, like what percentage of your breeder stock have you produced? That's a good question. Um, Carl, wow. Very yeah, good. I, I don't know that I've actually tried to figure that out. Um, 10 points. Not, not quite as many as you would think. I, I don't. Uh, I okay. definitely hold animals back to raise up. Um, but, you know, I've uh, just, I've acquired a lot of animals from just other sources and sort of aggregated things together and, uh, and, and put it together that way. So I don't know, there's probably only something like 25% um, or so of our adults are ones that we produced and others are just things that we had to have that other people had and yeah. we gathered it all together. I was going to ask if you had seen any any like uh, you know higher production rate or, or you know better health or throughout breeding in in your offspring you know well, ones that have been so, in the system a long time. 
Yeah, I mean, it's the 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 deeper conversation of that is inbreeding. Um, yeah, and, and that's and, and you can tie this to the morph conversation as well. Generally speaking, the idea morph. of morphs is sort of not cool with the drum archon community because yeah. people think a lot more about genetic strength and and that and, and people sort of associate morphs with inbreeding and defects sure. and whatever else and so uh, people in the drum archon community are generally more about the wild type look yeah. and not as much about morphs and they're very anti-inbreeding and for good reason because sure. particularly with the eastern indigos you can't take them out of the wild they've been prote protected for a few decades now and so the gene pool is pretty shallow you know Right. And so when I'm pairing animals, uh, that that's what gets my thought. I, I don't think about line breeding. I don't think about accentuating, you know, a red color or whatever else. I think about genetic strength. I think about that sort of thing. So um, I do have a pretty extensive spreadsheet that I've kept over the years for Easterns in particular, where I'm keeping track of who the sire was, who the dam was, what percentage of the babies uh, um, had any defects, if any. Uh, what were the fertility rates? And then if if I have an animal that is not producing good stuff, then I get rid of it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll and i raise up things that I know are going to do better. And, and over the years, you just sort of learn what to look for in a good breeder. And it's not always just a healthy looking snake. You sometimes need more than that. So um, yeah, that's, that, that's a lot more of the thought process in Jar Markon. It's a lot okay. less about color. It's a lot more about genetic strength. Yeah, because I've definitely heard that over time about dry marcon in, in, in general. And I feel like that's a thought process that is not considered enough um, across the board. But um, I guess, you know, follow up to that would be, in general, does it seem like there's more inbreeding depression amongst dry marcon than we see in most other reptiles? Like like carpet pythons is on that same line of, you know, uh, of indigos where it's been a very limited gene pool for, you know, 30 years and people are still inbreeding the living fuck out of those. Pardon my French. Well, it's, but, uh, yeah, I mean, do do dry marcon see more drastic changes in other species? Do you think? Yeah, so it, uh, I think they are pretty sensitive to it. You know, okay. uh, e eastern indigos more so than than the rest. Um, but you know, like anything else, there are a lot of traits that are genetically inheritable, and and the ones that you want to avoid, obviously, are the ones that are going to affect the animal's health or yeah. longevity, right? And so the two biggest issues that will pop up. Um, are, you know, you hear about stargazing and whatever else and some of the other, uh, you know, species. But for indigos, it's an enlarged heart. Sometimes they'll be born with an enlarged heart um, or dwarfism. And so uh, those two things can be difficult to predict when you have a hatchling. Um, you don't always see the enlarged heart until they're a year or two old. And then all of a sudden you're, the enlarged heart ruptures and you've got a dead snake. And, and that's, you know, an inbreeding issue. Um, there are some things that people will point to some of the scales on the tail and whatever else is an indication of inbreeding. Um, you know, while that may be, you know, some of the case, what you really want to avoid, obviously, are the really inbred animals yeah. um, that are producing offspring that end up showing some of these really, uh, you know, deficiencies in their health, whether it's dwarfism or whatever else. Dwarfism. You know, you'll be you'll buy a baby snake, you'll raise it up, and it gets to be about four feet, and it stops getting longer, and it starts getting fatter. You know, yeah. and it should be seven feet long. You know, and they never get past four feet; they just get fat. And a snake like that should should never be bred. You know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, actually, uh, that's interesting for me to hear. I used to work at a zoo, and we we had um, we had eastern indigos, but I remember one that. Is exactly like you're describing about four feet long and as thick around as an adult um mm -hmm. so if this dwarfism is i mean obviously it's a a trait that's kind of you know goes across the the dry mark you know okay, spectrum right. can you just like talk a little bit more about that you know like how it i guess how it manifests and it seems like it's a thing to me you don't hear about it a lot in other species um right is this is it a consistent thing over a long time you know, I really, I, I only really see it in, in in eastern indigos. I've seen it come up here and there in Texas indigos, um, but you know, again, it's it's a hard thing to to predict when they're babies. You know, yeah, um, because they'll, they'll be totally normal looking as babies, and then you know, all of a sudden you have a problem. But I don't know if it's as huge of a problem as as some people make it sound out to be. 
Uh, I've really only come across a handful of dwarves, um, you know, in my in my experience working with them. Uh, I don't know that it happens a ton, um, but you know, again, part of that is that I think um, there's probably a little bit more responsibility and awareness in the drum archon community of inbreeding than some of the other, you know, colubrids where morphs are more common, and you know, line breeding and morph breeding are more common. Yeah, so I remember. Like you mentioned earlier, the uh, the piebald Eastern Indigo. Um, I remember when that popped up, and you know, I was kind of an observer of the dry Markon community, and I thought that was you know a breakthrough. And then reading the reaction to it, you, you know, you, you didn't hear that oh, same yeah. kind of response. That was super so, negative. Yeah, yeah. So that that really never went anywhere, from what I understand. Uh, right? No, I mean, I I know the guy who has that snake. Um, I, I know that he got a clutch of babies out of it, which are all normal looking. And then you know, obviously, anyone who's worked with morphs knows the next step would be to breed a baby back to the back to the piebald original and even just that idea makes dry mark on owners cringe. So more um, are we talking about ball pythons? Yeah. No, those, those are just, no, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it all these it. conversations gel together. I mean, the, 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 the morphs and genetics and line breeding, it's, it's all a, a different perspective in the drum arc on world. Yeah. So, so then how does that work with the, um, with the yellow tails with the cryos? Like not because you can still get wild bloodlines. Um, are there a lot of yeah. people who are trying to acquire those imported ones specifically for that purpose? Well, so to, to my knowledge, there's only, there's only one exanthic yellowtail. I think there, I think I heard of another one too, maybe a couple and, and I've got one of them. Nobody's really bred them yet. So, I mean, that's. Or, yeah, or even but, just the normal phenotypes, just the, that new bloodline, you know, like a, right. a wild caught adult like is, is that a is that a commodity in the yellowtail world because of the new potential genetics in in the yellowtail world uh yes in that sometimes you get some of the imports that are just super pretty that just have a lot of you know really nice yellow and right. so people will really want to you know add that into their breeding group and whatever else and you know me included uh but you know when you're dealing with wildcat tramarcon especially if they come in as adults it's just a whole nother set of issues to worry about i mean parasites sure temperament, um, dehydration, uh, you know, all those things. There's just so much more to, to deal with when you're talking about a, a wild caught uh, snake. Mm -hmm. But but in general, I mean, the, you know, I don't know. Uh, yellowtails are really the ones that are offered the most as wild caughts. But in general, yeah, I mean, it's having uh, strategically uh, putting together a breeding group from different breeders or from different stock and different lineages is definitely something that uh, responsible dry mark on breeders think about a lot. So uh, with those yellow tails, do you see a, a drop in that yellow color or an increase, you know, in the F1 and the F2? Because a lot of reptiles that naturally have a lot of yellow pigment or high white pigment or whatever will lose that in the first generation, like Aru green tree pythons or yellow tree monitors. Do you see any of that with yellow tree bows? Not really. I mean, the okay. babies tend to, the babies tend to follow along with the parents, you know, uh, with whatever it is. And, you know, but okay. again, it's it's, you know, people... Like you hear about that with gray banded king snakes, for example, where you know that you'll get three or four generations in and they don't look anything like the wild type animals, you know, even though it was allegedly kept locality. But you know, um, but that's line breeding, and that's what you, you know you do when you try to enhance a certain trait. And you know, in general, I, I avoid doing that anyway. So it's uh, you know, for me, I just want I just want a, a, a big baby that's super robust and hardy, yeah. No, definitely. MJ, you got anything? I just want to ask what the hell this is. I mean, I don't know. You, I, I'm reading it, and it says a, a Kriba wannabe or something, or Indigo wannabe. What is that? Is that a, a king snake? Or what? I'm, I'm, I'm just pleased if you don't mind clarifying. I'm trying to trying to remember this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I was in I was in traveling in South Carolina. That's a black racer. Damn, that's sick. Yeah, no, I, they list, there there are a lot of. All, I mean, I'm always drawn to like the black snakes and whatever that. Uh, yeah, they were cool. Not an indigo, but they're cool. All right, but check this out. Man, I kind of feel bad. Um, I always, like, have a reference where I'm just being a smart ass. It's like, you know, like, breed milk snakes. Like, I don't think milk snakes are anything that great, but a piece of shit because this is probably one of the sickest milkshake mil milkshakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Milk snakes. I'm sorry. Milk snakes. Bro, this is a really, really sick-looking milk, milk snake. Like, this is kind of making me re rethink everything. Um, and this is stuff you work with, right? 
Right. So th this is a newer project. I talk about sort of dabbling in side projects here and there. I mean, I just came across these at a show and I thought they were awesome. And um, yes. many, many years ago, I found some in the wild in the, uh, in the Yucatan oh, near Playa del Carmen and all that. And uh, so I was I into it. So I bought like all of them that the guy had. And, um, and after that, I sort of started learning about them and piecing together after I already had them. So my understanding was that uh, many years ago that there was a patternless milk snake found in the Yucatan and it made its way into the United States and it was eventually paired up with another milk and that all of, all of these snakes sort of derive from that pairing of that lineage. And, uh, you get, when you breed the patternless one to the, to the banded one and whatever, you get all, all different phenotypes in the middle. So, wow. um, you can get patternless looking ones with those sort of faded bands with the patternless belly and. Sometimes they'll have like donut spots on the top and whatever, and all of those can range out of the same pairings, which I thought, I thought was pretty cool. So you're trying, you're telling me you could find these in in PDC, Playa del Carmen, in in Tulum, and in, in places like that. Is are you is that where you're, that's like my party stopping grounds right there? Well, you gotta get you gotta get you gotta stop partying and get out in the get out in the jungle, man. Damn, no, dude, I don't party there no more. I just got married, bro. Hey, 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 I just got married. I got, I got married, I got married in uh, Playa Mujeres. Um, but I used to play at a festival called uh, BPM. BPM Festival used to be at Playa de Carmen. And there were times that I used to dedicate, you know, I would take like a break or, break or two off of, of partying, sort of, or just couldn't sleep. And I would just try to like, go look for stuff and i was just like i'm pretty sure there's no snakes here i'm pretty confident there's no snakes here and i would see sick ass like lizards or like you know iguanas or something you know if they were iguanas um but snakes never saw snakes didn't even i would i would even kind of research snakes in the area and i never saw milk snakes like ever so I, there were several so you just got to get on 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 rural roads that go back through the jungle and don't have a lot of traffic there are tons of snakes i mean Wow. Uh, the, the hard part was finding roads because you, you you find them by road cruising, right? So you're driving on the roads at night. And the hard part is finding roads that don't have a lot of traffic on them. And when you do, you see dead snakes all over the place. There, there's a lot of wow. neat stuff in the Yucatan. Hmm. Man, let's go to Yucatan together, man. Yeah, yeah, man. I'll put partying aside. Forget partying. Let's just go find yeah. some milk snakes. There you go. I know. Listen, I know where some bum local spots to eat at. You know, I'm, I'm telling you. I whenever we, I go down to there, I tell my wife we're not eating where all the tourists go eat. We're gonna go deep into like the communities and where like the locals eat, and that's where, you, that's where you find the bomb stuff. So all I gotta do is take that energy with the snakes or with the with the herping and go deep into it. Deep into it. Deep into it. <laughs> I really think it's awesome because I never really gave gave milk snakes a time of day, and coming across these, I'm just like, man, these are just these are just super sick. What? Why are you guys laughing? Did I say milkshake again? Why are you guys laughing? I never gave them I a mean, time of day. Yeah, I, the milk snake hit me. I don't get it, but you know, I'm glad they're coming around finally. Yeah, the first time. yeah. Because I think milk snakes, like just the name by itself, I'm not. I, I don't. I don't. Why are they? Okay, let's talk about this. Why the hell are they called milk snakes? You don't know the old wives' tale? <laughs> Please tell me, Steven. I love stories. It's like, you know, all the farmers were like, oh, they're coming on my farm and stealing the milk from my cows. It's like, no, they're eating the mice that are in your barn. But, oh. Are you for yeah. real on this? Is that right? Is that is that the real reason why they call milk snakes? From my understanding. That's, wow. uh, that's my Good. understanding as well. What? Yeah. Are you for <laughs> New life. Oh my god. There you go. No way. I didn't even know that. I really thought I was like, oh shit, a little smart ass Carl's coming, but that was a legit <laughs> facts right there. I am really impressed. Wow. All right, cool. So that's why they call milkmaid. Shut me up. That's awesome. Um man, awesome. So you got a new project with those. Definitely long heavy for you. I mean, are, I mean, what's your what's your game plan with the milk snakes? Like, what are you what are you looking Not to much. do? Nothing. I mean, <laughs> nothing. It's just something to play around with. Uh, you know, I got a couple breeding pairs. I'll produce a few snakes, and you know, I'm not I'm not known in the milk snake world. Whatever. Maybe I'll sell a couple. Whatever. It's just something to play with to keep me uh, interested and branch out from the drum archon. I just have to ask you. Been in the game for 15 years. What is your insight on the ball python market? They make great feeders for indigos. <laughs> well, well. So, I mean, it seems like um, I'm correct if I'm wrong, but 
you know, like Mexico and, you know, Northern South America just seems to be where your interest lies. Is there, is there a reason particularly or just everything that you're asking? Uh, you know, I don't know why that is. I, I've never been into African snakes. I've never really been into Asian snakes that much. Uh, there are a few things here and there, but for whatever reason, Latin America has always been my, uh, been my draw. It's just always sort of stuck there. When I go out herping in other countries, that's where I end up. Yeah. Oh, Have you ever just, uh, just into it? Have you ever dabbled or been interested in any of the venomous species that are native of the, those ranges? Yeah, but I, I can't keep them. Oh, I can't right, legally yeah. keep them. Is no, is, right. is the problem? So you know, uh, you know, r referring back to the question of like, what would I keep if I had no time, space, or money restrictions? If I had no legal restrictions, yeah, I mean, I'd I'd keep some hots for sure. Um, I mean, the top of my field herping wish list, which I have not yet gotten as a bushmaster. Okay. Um, Woo. Haven't gotten it yet. Those are hot, bro. Those are hot. What would you think it's like getting bit from a bit bushmaster? Uh, I'm not into that idea. No. It's probably one of the worst deaths. We'd be comparing stories on a whole different level. I've I've heard I've heard a story. Yeah. I know you heard this story. Okay. They're, they're no wow. joke. Yeah, they're no joke. Hell no. Hell no. Bushmasters, man, they're no joke. And they're in Costa Rica, right? Yep. Man, I would love that. I, I, Costa Rica is the one. Time I I that what was that? Say that again. You got some eyelash vipers on your Instagram. Is that just? Yeah, it's Costa Rica. That's Costa Rica. Yeah, um, I, I go to Costa Rica a lot. Um, okay. and it's seldomly on dedicated herb trips, but when I'm down there with the family or whatever, uh, you know, I'm okay. always poking around. I did some reading. It does say that on here. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> eyelash vipers are cool, man. They're they're super cool. I like that. Mm. Have you ever seen any other the Bothriacus in your? Uh, I haven't brain? actually. Just just Schlegelei. I haven't uh, come across any of the the higher montane stuff. But really, just because I never really look up there. The other mm. stuff is in Costa Rica, at least is is higher elevation stuff, and I'm usually not up there. Huh. I have a question, real quick. No, go ahead. Did somebody else have something? Because I I just want to. Ask. I, I was going to kind of change the uh, topic a little bit, but if you have something else, you know, go for it. I just want to know whatever happened to this because uh, I remember, you know, when I first started coming to the hobby, I, I started seeing these and I just want to know what kind of bullshit judges they have off this or how this works. Because am, am I, am I assuming wrong? You were nominated. You actually didn't win this or what's going on with this? Oh man, you're, you're digging deep here. 2014. Yeah. The, uh, these awards. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't recall winning that. You should have. Yeah, that's what you did. So it's, no, it's this, is, this, is, this is too political here. This is why I just step away to, from certain. Well, maybe I needed to do more podcasts to campaign myself. <laughs> well, now it's going down. Hey, whoever wants to go and do a report this year, good luck. This guy's, you're going down. This fool's going to win this shit. I'm just saying, come on, bring it back. Bring it back. The Luber Breeder of the Year. Do they do they do that still? I'm, I I thought they, like, the last time I saw that was, like I said, when I first started coming in. So I think it was 2017 yeah. or 18. Yeah. I don't I feel like I haven't seen that in a couple of years, but uh, I'm not, I don't, I'm not really involved in that sort of thing. I don't Hilarious. really care. Oh, I, yeah. see. So, uh, I want to touch on the, uh, on the Muserana. Um, yeah, yeah. How'd you get into that? And what was it like with those? I feel like Muserana, like what just, well, I think I'll explain. Oh, okay. uh, I'll explain. I, I, uh, he'd be better than me. Muserana. Well, so it's, it, it's a good segue because that started with field herping in Costa Rica. So, uh, a Muserana is a colubrid. They can get eight feet long, uh, but they're not quite as stocky as an indigo. They're more of like a king snake build, a little bit more slender, and uh, they're rear fanged, um, and uh, they're natural snake eaters in the wild. So they'll take down fur lances, rattlesnakes, whatever. Um, they're super gnarly, super intense. And uh, many years ago, um, I found one in the wild in Costa Rica, and it just, I was just in awe of this snake. It was just so uh, cool. They're super mellow, super docile to handle. They really don't bite out of defense really ever, but it's just, you got this eight feet foot long snake, this jet black, it's rear fanged. And, you know, they take down all these venomous snakes and, uh, and they're super chill. So I got back and I did some more research on them in the pet trade and I was, uh, you know, I found people offering them and I, and I picked up a couple of them and they have a, a piebald muserana. Um, and they were really kind of new into the pet trade at the time when I was getting into them. And um, I ended up 
importing them from a breeder in Uruguay who was kind of started that whole piebald uh, Muserana thing. So I would import from him, keep some for myself, sell the rest and whatever. And uh, they're super neat snakes. They're, they're really cool. I like them a lot. Am I wrong that they are the only species of snake that is both venomous and constricts? That's a good question. It's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. Because it's like this uh, I mean, they're, snake, venomous. It's a constrictor. It eats right. venomous snakes. Like they're one of the most badass snakes in the world. Like, well, I know. think being a being yeah. a venomous snake eater is is part of it. You know that um, you know because yeah. they do when you feed them, they do the whole. I don't know if you've ever seen this with a king snake or whatever. They they do the whole spiral thing where it's not just like constricting in a ball, uh, but they'll sort of spiral in like a cone. Uh, which a lot of snake eaters will do naturally. And so the Muserana will do that. And they'll combine that with the rear fang venom. I mean, they're, they're intense feeders, man. They're super intense. Like they got a gnarly snack. feeding response. Yeah. I, I just got Des addicted by uh -oh. showing her a video of one of yours eating a snake. Uh, yeah. So yeah, piebalds are my favorite ball python morphs, but this, uh -huh. this is, I like this. Yeah, it's pretty cool. The black and white is really neat. It's a, wow. it's a codom trait. So there's a super form as well, which is just all white with a black head. And they usually have a little bit of black in the body, but uh, the, they're, they're neat, man. They're super cool. Their heads are very crate-like. So yeah. you're breeding too or what? That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I bred them for a lot of years. I got out of them for a little while, um, uh, but I missed them. So I got a couple back again. So I have some again now, but um, they're, uh, they're a bit of work as babies because the babies, the babies are tougher than drum arc on to switch over to rodents. So uh, I got, I got so, uh, you know, swamp with the drum arc on stuff. I, uh, I didn't want to spend the time getting baby moose around a feeding, but I missed them. So I, I have some back now. Damn, we haven't had an episode this hot since I don't know how long. This is just I can, a I can get the babies going if you want to say <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I mean what like did you just say, Desiree, you swindler, you little little freaking Hey, all I do now is wrap out Like that's it. That's my job now. Big so, um, it it really helps, yeah, she, she helps has the... me mentally. Just, I just do wrap towels. So. She, she, she has the real cushy job around here. She's not in the trenches with us, you know. So I'm allergic to rodents. Let's let's remind everyone. Yeah, okay? give her all, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, exactly. She let her cause from her reptiles, please. Yeah, but seriously, I have a lot of patients and I love babies. So there you go. <laughs> if you get the babies going, let me know. Hey, John. So what's the breeding with those like? You know. I mean, I bet they are way more inclined to eat each other than the Kribos are, right? Yeah, that that you have to watch out for. In, in fact, one of the uh, a fun story that came out of that once is that uh, that females will uh, get larger than the males, and mm -hmm. uh, so it, usually, if I have one trying to eat another, it's a female trying to eat him, eat the male. Yeah. And I actually once had a female turn around and start trying to eat a male while he was in the middle of being locked up with him. Like what? in the middle of the process. Damn. So uh, yeah, that's 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 one you definitely have to watch out for when they're breeding. You gotta uh, pairing your muserana. It's got to be under the right temps, the right conditions, and even then you gotta watch it super carefully because they're they're intense. They're no joke. When they want to eat, they're they they're no joke. That's wild. <laughs> oh, they're so cool. It's like they just don't give a fuck. They're just badass. No. Yeah. They don't care. But, uh -huh. you know, listen, that's the type of snake I'm into. I mean, yeah, hey, dude, and more power to you. I mean, you think about it. I mean, you're, you have like you're into one of the most non wimpiest snakes. Period. Like, your snakes, <laughs> your snakes are ready for war. If there were ever a snake, if all the snakes were to come together and they're like, listen, all the women in the back, ball python, like go in the back, and then the and ball pythons are in the back, and then you have the scrubs. You'll have the scrubs and the indigos. Like yeah. the, I think the scrubs would be like the generals, in my opinion. Hey. I, feel like, I feel like a king cobra would have to would be but, the one that went. Like, the kings would be up there, yeah. But you put your sand boas and your ball pythons. Sand the boas back. are savage. No, yeah. Yeah. They stay home and watch the children. Sand boas are more savage, I even think, than the ball pythons. Ball pythons yeah, are like, yeah, the feet. Put them, in the, <laughs> put them in the huts and lock them up. Leave them alone. Like, you know what I mean? And then you have you then you have literally the scrubs who are like I feel like they'd be first in command, and Indigos are like the Navy SEALs. Like you fucking, like you just put them in there to fucking clean house. Like too many dads around. No, I'm just saying. Like you th I've always thought about this. 
I, that's why I was like, I, was about about this this. About this. <laughs> I always think about what species would be king if it ever came down to, and we're, I'm not talking about, I'm not thinking about king cobras or anything. I'm talking oh, about like, the king species. of all reptiles. Species. Would be a saltwater crocodile sized dwarf. Cave. I'm talking about snakes, not freaking monitors or lizards. I'm talking about if there were just a war with snakes, a war with snakes, right? Nobody could yeah, fuck yeah, anymore. Yeah, 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 okay. Just snakes. Anyways, no. good call. Indigos are tough. That's all I'm saying. All I was trying to say. Don't fuck with an indigo. I don't know. There's some mean scrubs out there. Um, scrubs will get eaten by an indigo. I guarantee it. Not a not an adult. Well, hold on, not an adult, not an adult. We're not talking about an adult scrub. Adult scrubs are goddamn humongous, and that's a whole other story. I guess I'm talking about my scrubs. My scrubs are small. <laughs> you have some really cool spilotes. Say what? It's another side project that's kind of fun. What's your uh, group with those right now? Uh, so yeah, the 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 spilotes that I'm into are from Mexico. Um, it's a different subspecies. The ones that you see kind of all the time in the pet trade are the ones that are imported from South America, which are generally not as colorful. And interestingly enough, temperament wise, they're a lot more mean. Uh, the, the Mexican ones tend to be more chill and more colorful. So I'm into those, uh, have not been super successful breeding them. So I don't know that I can impart a whole lot of, uh, wisdom on that regard, but I, I like keeping them. They're super cool. And hopefully they'll start uh, breeding more consistently for me, but uh, they're pretty snakes and you know, they're different than the ones you get the, the wild caught imports, man. They're, they're, they're pretty chill. They're, they're not really prone to biting much. I mean, have you bred them at all before? I have gotten one clutch. Okay. How'd that go? What was the process like? Uh, it was good. I, I I'm, I'm repeating the same process that I did there over and over again and it's, mm -hmm. and it's not working. So, uh, I'm working on it. I think moisture is a part of it, you know, okay. uh, mimicking a, a rainy season is part of it. Um, I try to, you know, really dry them out to, you know, to duplicate a dry season and then spray and miss the heck out of them for a while. And hopefully that sparks stuff. And, um, that's a, that's a process I'm still working on. Hmm. So do you, do you keep them in racks like the rest of your snakes or do you have no. them in like larger, more arboreal enclosures? No, those are larger arboreal enclosures. Those are ones that I want to see all the time. Yeah. I, I mean, I want to see all my snakes, but it, you know, Indigos, you know, they'll they'll end up hiding a lot too. The spilotes are just so just bold. I mean, they just lay out. They don't care if you're looking at them or not. They're 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 chill and they're so beautiful. It's uh it's hard not to display those. Do, do you cohabitate yours? I do. And what's interesting about it is that um, obviously feeding. I need to be careful, but I do feel like there's like a level of like sociability among them too. Like there are times when when my snakes want to be together like all the time and it's not even breeding where they're just coiled together. They're hanging out together. There are other times when they're just totally apart. They don't want anything to do with each other. They're on opposite sides hiding. So it, it's weird the way it works. There's some kind of social connection there that, 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 you know, you don't often see in snakes. I, yeah. I feel like if you, I feel like with a lot of snakes, um, if the enclosure is big enough and stuff like that, I mean, I feel like cool having could happen a lot more than it's happening now. Yeah, if, yeah. If, I mean, it, 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 it depends on a lot of things, of course. I mean, feeding, you got to be careful. Right. If you're, I'm just saying, if, if it's feeding, if it's stuff you're really prioritizing and you're making sure you're on top of it. Because um, I always I, – I have this one guy that I follow, and I see that he ha he houses mangroves together a lot. Like, he, it's something where, you know, and, and everyone says, oh, God, you know, mangroves pairing, you know, like – it's though they it, the chances are really high that they eat each other or they mess each other up or whatever the case is. Right. But I'm like, damn, dude, this guy literally houses them like, you know, and he obviously does something right when it comes to feeding because he'll be posting pictures and he'll have three mangroves in a closure and they all got like a chick in their mouth or a rat in their mouth. And they're all, they all eat at the same time. But, uh, but Bayoga man, Aaron, it's pretty sick. Uh, <laughs> One of the things that I liked about doing with that too is that you know, I, I don't really know how to breed them well, and so part of that was whatever, dude. Shut up. Okay, everyone, shut up. Like that Yeah, I'm, I'm listening. Sorry, sorry about part. Of, part of that was figuring it out, you know, because if you house them separately and you're trying to breed them, then you have to pair them at the right time, you know. Yeah. And so sometimes cohabbing can be a good thing when you're working with a species where not much is known about breeding them. 
you know, because you, you can watch to see when they're more interested in each other, when they're not more interested in each other and whatever else that can kind of help you solve the puzzle. Yeah. You, uh, what is one thing you guys cohab, um, Desiree and Steven? Uh, black. Like, oh, yeah. Black dragons. Dragons. How, are How are those doing? The black dragons. How are those? They're a little, they're a little assholes. But, uh, <laughs> they're well though. They're, yeah, they're, they're thriving. They're eating big. They're doing great. They're just still, still tail whipping me. So I'm going to separate them and like move them to a higher level. So they see me more. I think they just have to be even in closure. They're like running away too much. So you should do that. A uh, little tip that Blake Wilson said, remember you put them in a little small container by yeah, yeah, that's, that's that's the plan. in the kitchen and shit, like something where there's a lot of interaction and a lot of like, movement and stuff. Yeah. They don't uh, want to bite, so I'm just gonna start grabbing them every day and just. Yeah, you'll be all right. You're, I mean, come on. Social condition, you know. You guys are good. You got monitors in your blood. You guys are gonna yep. be out. So like other than but snake wise, right now we don't cohab anything. No. Uh, but going forward, something that I would be interested in doing would be uh, cohabitating scrub pythons in like big, big enclosures. Um, particularly, right. particularly. Oh. All right. Particularly with Lincoln, because so little is known about their breeding. You know, barn necks have been done more successfully and whatnot. Um, I like that. But the, the Malukan scrubs, I feel like a, a large, you know, for instance, like a, a eight by three by five foot tall, like a really, really large enclosure. And give them some different microclimates in there and just see what happens. Or another one would be uh, annulated tree boas. Mm -hmm. I know people definitely cohabitate annulated. And uh, we had an infertile litter this year, or a litter of slugs. Um, she ate them. I, yeah, she did eat her own slugs. It was pretty cool, actually. Um, I think that would be another species that would be very interesting to try cohabitation with. I think we need to have an episode on cohabitation, period, because I think we, this could just go on forever. I'm not even going to lie. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, like with all the people that are breeding snakes, nobody cohabitates. No, they don't. I mean, there's a, there's a handful of people who have projects yeah. that cohabitate. Like very few. There's a very few little people yeah. who do it, and they do it right. And, and one group of people that does do a lot of cohabitation are Spilotes people. Uh, so I've heard yeah. in general people who bred them keep the keep those things together year round. And you know, I, from the people who breed them, what I've heard, that's what they attribute a lot of the success to is cohabitation. So no, there there are people that I've talked to Spilotes breeders that will swear up and down, and it's totally counterintuitive to most conventional reptile knowledge that that a male and a female need to like know each other before they're going to breed, you yeah. know, that they, that they have, they can't just be strangers, you know, that they have to know each other. They have to spend time together, get used to each other. And then maybe they breed, That's yeah. very which is, which is a bizarre way to think in the reptile world. But um, That's what's great yeah. about getting perspectives from the complete opposite spectrum, you know, because real Python breeder could really take something away from a, a Kaluber breeder or, or vice versa, or, you know, yeah. all together. That's what makes yeah. everyone, everyone so streamlined in their thinking. And then I feel like there's another camp where everyone just overthinks everything. Right. Overthinkers right. compound on right. overthinkers, right. compound on overthinkers, and they screw everything up because they've overthought it. And right. they're opportunity to just over overthinking is like overheating in your incubator. You're fucked. You just can't <laughs> you don't want to do that. You, you just can't come back from overheating. You can't come back from overthinking. Right. I just want some Bolin's pythons. I want to put them in our ambient room and just keep them in the Vision Boa tubs, and I want to breed them in that. There you go. Yeah. I want to ultrasound and breed them like that. Breed them yeah. like gourmet. Hey, we should be that easy. Hey, but John. Because who's, who's doing that, though? Well, right. know, maybe that's what you're missing. Maybe, maybe, they have maybe the tough thing, thing is they're overthinking it. They have a 50-degree fucking temperature gradient and, like, UV for this amount of time this part of the year and then there and the basking spot for five hours then for two hours it's like they're snakes like maybe you're stressing them out with all this change yeah. you know maybe that's why they're not breeding is they're in a completely foreign environment they're in captivity and now you're putting them through all these environmental stressors what's what if that's what's causing them to not breed pick one environment, leave them really could be. you know there's not enough of a, a sample size to know if that's if that's the case honestly Hundred percent facts. Hey, John, um, this has been an amazing two hours. You, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't felt a fire podcast like this. Not, I mean, nothing against the last few podcasts. We still had an amazing one, but this right here felt the connection. I felt the energy. It was on fire. What is your wrap up question for John Stephen? 
I mean, the, the typical rap question was already answered with the bull and I. Um, if you were to venture outside of snakes, what is a species of reptile or animal in general that you'd love to keep money? Oh, animal in general. Space, wow. Space aside. Giraffe. A giraffe. Okay. Explain. Hey, why not? Uh, no, I, I got to spend some time with a giraffe uh, a little while back. There's uh, uh, a place local to here that does animals for the movies, and I've got to hang out. I've uh, had the opportunity to hang out with this giraffe named Tiny, and he's, uh, what is he, he's over 16 feet tall, something or other. And uh, Tiny and I get along. We're buds. I like hanging out with Tiny. I think if I had unlimited space, I had a ranch somewhere, unlimited money, I'd have a giraffe. That's a good answer. One of, one, of, one of the most player answers I've ever heard, a giraffe. Yeah, you respect that big time. <laughs> yeah, I think there are a lot of animals you just you just don't, you, you know, you, you look at them, you see it on TV, you don't know what they're all about. When you get to hang out with them for a little bit, sometimes you're surprised. I didn't think I'd feel a connection with a giraffe, but I did. <laughs> Great. Yeah, who, um, who is your biggest mentor coming up? Good question. Uh, you know, a, a lot of kind of what I've learned, it just kind of came internally with my partner and I, but really I think the guy that I would say when I was first getting started was more in the milk snake days with Shannon Brown. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he was big in the colubrid world for a long time and he passed away a couple of years ago, uh, fortunately. But, uh, um, Shannon and I had, had a lot of in-depth conversations when I didn't know anything about keeping reptiles or breeding or whatever else. So, uh, you know. Uh, Sh Shannon was a man for a lot of people. Okay, cool. All right, shout to Shannon Brown. Uh, my last final question for you, uh, John, is what is your advice for anybody? Like my, you know, I don't keep indigos, right? Super after, especially after this episode, I am super dedicated and motivated to trying to figure out how I could get my hands on one. Mm -hmm. Obviously, for you, right? <laughs> Desiree, me. Uh, anyways, what's your? <laughs> What's your advice for somebody like myself? Like, what would you tell somebody myself or anyone who wants to dip into the species and has not yet kept the species? Uh, you know, I, I think with with indigos, there's there's, and with is probably the same with a lot of species is that there's a right way to do it, and without overthinking it, you can't cut corners, and you have to do it right. You know. And if you have a few of their basic setups, you know, correct, if you got the temperature right, the humidity right, whatever else, they're going to be really hardy for you. Yeah. So spend some time, talk to people like me, you know, and a lot of the time what you read on the internet is not necessarily what's best. Um, and, uh, and then once you, once you do it, don't cut corners. There are a lot of people that are just going to cut corners and, and, um, and not take care of their animals correctly. Generally speaking, when you're dealing with animals with a high price tag, that those sorts of buyers sort of weed themselves out. Um, yeah. But because usually, if you're going to spend a thousand dollars on an animal, you're going to generally, you know, want to do the research to take care of it. But uh, you know, do the animal right. Do the animal right. Make sure you're taking care of it correctly. There it is. Yeah. It's plain right there. Plain and simple. Do the research before you invest. The research. In it, basically, yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, you got anything for us, John, before you sign out? Anything you want to say? Um, you know, I, I could tell you right now, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but there are a couple people out there who know who the hell you are, and they are very impressed with what you have going on. I'm definitely one of them. Um, so anything you got to say or anything you want to say before right, you Listen, I, I, I appreciate it. Anyone who's watching or listening in or whatever, appreciate it. And uh, it's uh, it's just always fun to hang out and chat with people that all think the same and have the same weird obsession. So uh, yeah. thanks for having us, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, make sure you check out this guy's website. This guy's website is super primo and legit, blackpearlreptiles.com. And you you heard his protocol. If you really want to hop on this guy's list, like I said, it's pretty long, you know, especially far from where me and Desiree are at. So, you know, <laughs> just get out of here. Um, and listen, John, hey, man, keep doing what you're doing, man. I'm, I'm telling you right now. Appreciate you, it. This, is a, this was a really huge honor to have somebody – um on this podcast because you you are completely separate from anyone else that we've had on species yeah it's very, i learned a lot uh, yeah. i learned a lot round two worthy if you're cool with it but uh thank you so much yeah, john man. you have a great night be safe um and keep the hey, just keep doing what you're doing man we're, we're excited to see what the future holds for you man right on hey thanks i appreciate it guys thanks for having thanks, me thank you right. reptiles, man all right see you later john bye all right bye guys Woo! That was, hot. that was a good episode. It's been a while.
since I mean, I'm just saying, I don't, I don't want to keep saying that, but I felt like the flow was good. Like it was just, you know, a solid two hours, which I feel like could have went another couple of hours. Um, oh, yeah. But man, what a, what a great episode, Dick. Stephen Desiree. Yeah, good was, job. That was really our first episode. Yeah. It, it, it was, uh, I feel solid. like there should be more to come. I think the most Kaluber talk we've ever had before was talking to Kevin about mangrove snakes. Right. But yeah. uh, that was within an episode that was full of a lot of stuff. <laughs> I'll respect the mangroves, but fuck mangroves, man. These Kribos and these fucking indigos are like savage. These are like, I feel like mangroves are like the little brothers to these. Like, these things are muscular. They're big. They're hardy. They don't yeah. fuck around. Like, yeah. Man, you saw the guy's nose. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it was gnarly. Yeah. Uh, great episode, guys. Um, I feel like we're back. Not that we were ever gone, but listen. We had a fire ass episode we just dropped. Uh, we have more to come. Our list is still heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, yeah, definitely get bringing some more diversity onto the show too. So I just, I want I want to say real quick, shout out to Stephen Cush and his scrub python clutch. Oh, one more time because I'm just so oh. happy. I'm just so happy for him. They're so cute. You oh got my goodness. He, said, he just deserves it. The, you know what I mean? This kid just deserves it. And he's doing it. I can't wait. I can't wait for his episode on the Trap Talk sessions. Just all Stephen Cush. I heard I have we're just waiting for his crown to come in. He's, he has like a design crown coming in. We have like this nice ass, you know, like oh it's gonna be sick. I, 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 I got like a snap. Oh, let's go. Oh, hear he, hear he. Okay. <laughs> oh man, dude. Shout out to everybody. I mean, hey, listen, we appreciate all the supporters, everyone who listens into this uh podcast that we got going on. It's not gonna stop. Shit is on points. Um, shout out to the sponsor, Cold Blooded Cafe, www.coldbloodedcafe.com. And then you already know sim containers, got some eggs, put them in a sim box. You will not be disappointed. But you guys have a wonderful night. You have a wonderful night. I'll have a wonderful night. And we'll see you guys next week for another Unfiltered Reptiles podcast. Um, oh, no! Ah! You who let him in? Who let him in? Bro, Why I, didn't you lock the door? I live Fuck. upstairs now. Fuck. We're fucked. I moved in to the upstairs apartment. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of great conversation about rare reptiles that, you know, need more representation in the public eye. Oh. But where was the <laughs> conservation? Tell me that. Where was the conservation? Ah. Eastern indigo snakes are federally threatened. <laughs> what are you doing to help the conservation? Yeah, you can't take them out of the wild, but what are you doing to help them in the wild? Are you setting up preserves for them to breed and reproduce naturally? Mm -hmm. What are you, yeah, you're buying captive bred reptiles. Whoop de do. Like, what are you doing for the wild ones? <laughs> Jesus Christ. We'll see you guys next week for another Hi. podcast. Good night. See you later. Yeah.